please, Your Lordship. Yes. I appear on behalf of the Haviland together with Mr. Wood, my learned friends, Mr. Shah, Queen's Council, and Mr. Boyne, here on behalf of Spice Group. My Lord, I was proposing to deal with my application for security for costs first. Uh, and my Lord, SpiceJet resists this application tooth and nail, but none of its objections withstand scrutiny. It's common ground, by the way. Especially before you start, um, the air cooling function isn't working in court. So if people start to feel that they're going to wilt, then do indicate, and we, we'll be happy if people want to remove wigs. Um, but um, I don't know how you feel at the moment. It may get warmer as the morning goes on. My Lord, yes. I'm great. My Lord, it's uh, common ground that the court has jurisdiction uh, because uh, the gateway in CPR 2513 subparagraph 2A is satisfied. But the critical question for your Lordship is, your Lordships is whether the Havilland has satisfied the court that it is just to make such an order. Now, the practical difficulties, the expense and delay which de Havilland faces in attempting to enforce the uh, order below in India, including the estimated costs of enforcement of between £216,000 and £432,000, in my submission, make it just for de Havilland to be secured for its uh, costs of this appeal. And but not there's the cost of enforcing the judgment sum. My Lord, yes. But on the security for costs of the appeal application, you can't rely on the costs of enforcing the judgment sum. No, but my Lord, the, the principle in NASA is that uh, I am entitled to security, to uh, security in respect of my costs of the claim, costs of an appeal, insofar as uh, to secure me for the additional burden that I have uh, in uh, enforcing my uh, claim. So although the costs, my point here is that although the costs well exceed my appeal costs, could be as much as £430,000 in India, that, that is a reason why it is just to make the order. But in terms of quantum, my uh, uh, security application is only for those costs of the appeal. I don't think that answers my Lord's question. The premise on which you get security for costs is you successfully resist the appeal. Oh, yes. If you successfully resist the appeal, you will have a judgment of $42.5 million, which you will be enforcing in India. Well, okay. Adding to that another 200000 or whatever it is for the costs of this appeal won't make the blindest bit of difference to the costs of enforcing it in India, because you'll be incurring those costs anyway. Well, <laughs> my lord, th then we are enforcing not only, I mean, th this is the point in NASA, this is the point that Lord Mance made, that uh, because the gateway is the fact that uh, we have a foreign uh, defendant, uh, the principle that Matt lo uh, uh, Lord Justice Mansi then was uh, laid out in NASA was that uh, you, you, the non discrimination principle uh, meant that you are only entitled to be secured in order to protect you from the additional burdens that you face from the fact that the defendant is in a foreign jurisdiction which is not a party to a relevant treaty. That is the case here. And the, what is the additional... I don't understand. We might have to look at NASA. My Lord, yes. But the costs of the appeal, 200,000, let's say, although that seems to me quite generous, short point of construction. But let's say you get an order for cost of 200,000. The cost of enforcing that in India, in addition to your 42 and a half million dollar judgment, the extra cost is nothing, because you'll be incurring costs, 432,000 or whatever it is, in any event, to go to India to enforce your 42 and a half million. Yes. So, so being put to the expense of the appeal doesn't change what you're going to spend in India by one penny. Well, th th the point about justice is whether we should be uh, limited to, because the position at the, at the moment prior to the appeal is that we have a judgment which the defendant is in breach of and which we will incur the estimated cost to enforce. And the, 
question is, is whether it is just for us to have to add to that uh, judgment sum the further costs of this appeal, or whether it would be just to secure those costs. And in my submission, the, the just outcome is that we shouldn't have to add the 200 odd thousand pounds for this appeal to that already burdensome uh, um, uh, set of well, enforcement I, costs. I, I could understand that if the principle was you're entitled to the costs of the appeal just because you've been subjected to an appeal which failed, so you should have security for the costs. But as I understand it, that's not what NASA says. NASA says all you're entitled to is the extra cost you're put to by being subjected to an appeal. Should we have a look at what Lord Mansell said? Yes. So you'll find NASA at uh, tab three. And the relevant passage in NASA you can find at page AB40, uh, and it's paragraph 61 to 63. And the uh, point that Lord Joseph Mance makes at 61 is that the discretion under this gateway should be uh, exercised on objectively justified grounds related to obstacles to or the burden of enforcement in the context of the foreign claimant. Once the power to order security arose, impecuniosity uh, became one of the material factors. The principle cannot survive because of the non effectively the non-discrimination principle. Then 62, the justification for the discretion uh, in relation to individuals, companies, ordinary resident board, uh, it, it, uh, uh, is where cases where there are substantial obstacles or substantial extra burdens. So it's not just extra, it's the existence of the burdens themselves in enforcing an English judgment. Because if it was an extra burden on top of what you already have because you've already got a, uh, a judgment, then that would suggest that if you apply when you've got a claim but hasn't been adjudicated, you can get security. So if I said to, 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 to uh, Sir Michael Burton, uh, I'm going to spend another £400,000 to enforce this order, please can I have security, I in the event that there was a claim I was facing, then the principle of non-discrimination would apply and I would get the uh, costs of the, the claim. But because I've won on appeal, it can't be right that then I'm no longer permitted to uh, uh, because uh, to, to get those uh, secure those costs because by definition because I was the claimant below but now I'm the respondent uh, facing uh, an appeal uh, I'm only limited to an extra burden and uh, uh, I don't face an extra burden because I've already got a 42 million uh, judgment and Lord Mance is saying at 63 it follows there's no inflexible assumption that there will be substantial obstacles he's not saying extra it's substantial obstacles obstacles to enforcement, and that's what we have here, uh, uh, or wherever the asset, in, in the country of foreign residents, where the assets are, if the discretion is to be exercised, there must be a proper basis for considering such obstacles may exist, uh, and this enforcement may be encumbered by extra burden, such as the cost of I I irrecoverable contingency, or simply uh, delay. And over the page at 67, the risk against which the, in this case it was defendants, because obviously this was uh, uh, first instance uh, order that was being appealed, that defenders are entitled to protection is thus not that the claimant will not have assets and not that the law of the state of residence will not recognise the uh, enforce the judgment it is that the steps taken to enforce the judgment in the US will involve an extra burden, it's the extra burden compared to the burden that we would face if the assets were in England or in the relevant treaty state, so that is the critical point and that is the answer to my Lord's point which is why it is just for us, because we have to go to India, in respect of the cost of the appeal, for us to be secured uh, against that. And, and, and the other cases, uh, I don't need to take you through all the other cases, but we've got cases in the bundle where mm. precisely this principle was engaged on appeal and the court, when looking at uh, conditional orders or strikeout orders on, on the appeal unless uh, the judgment sum was secured, they also ordered security for costs. So, my lord, we, we are, we say, right within the discretion. And indeed, my learned friend does not suggest any skeletons. I'll come on to his four objections. Yeah. His objection is not uh, that you don't get within the normal uh, uh, rule. And we say we're well within the normal rule. 
he's got four different objections, and those are the objections we so, so the, the answer to my point is the extra burden is not the extra burden compared with what you're going to spend anyway, but the extra burden compared with what would be the position if it was if, if the appellant was in a well in the UK or or a Brussels contracting. Precisely, my lord. Yes. Precisely. Thank you. But, but, but give me a, the, the difficulty about this is that Lord Mance is looking at at the first instance position, yes. where it will be a defendant who is awarded costs having defeated the claim. So they won't be enforcing a judgment at the same time. And what's being said is that now we're looking at this on a non-discriminatory basis. The mere fact you have to enforce abroad doesn't automatically mean you can have security for the costs. You have to look at the extra burden of enforcing abroad. It, 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 is, it is no different, the position, uh, to the position, because the, 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 the court's jurisdiction and the discretion of this court's jurisdiction is the same as if we were a first instance. Uh, it, it is, but one has to look, one has to look at, the, uh, at the slightly different context here, which is that, yes, you'd have to go and enforce these costs in India, and so that there would theoretically be more costs in enforcing a cost order in India. But in this case, there aren't. There won't be. Because you're already enforcing the costs, in, you're already enforcing a judgment in India. But ultimately, the question is wh whether the costs of this appeal should be added to that judgment sum. When we got that judgment sum, Malone and Friends clients were not the claimants, they were the defendants, so I could not seek yeah. to get security for costs, there was no jurisdiction. But now that they are in a position of a claimant, because they are the appellant, there is jurisdiction. Yes. And the position then in my submission reverts to exactly the same as I would have been if, if I was the defendant to a, a claim. And if the point wouldn't arise then, your lordship wouldn't then be able to say to me, but uh, you know, you, 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 obviously I didn't have a claim to enforce. The question then is, uh, uh, what's the additional burden of going to India? Give me the, the, the difficulty with this is this. You, you succeed in resisting the appeal and are awarded the costs against Mr. Charles Clark. Now, if you had those costs, uh, if they were an English defendant, you'd be enforcing them in England. Um, but if you were, if you also had a substantial judgment, it wouldn't it wouldn't cost you any extra. In fact, you're enforcing them in India. It isn't going to cost you any extra there. So the fact there, so in fact, there's no extra costs compared to England and India. In both cases, it wouldn't cost you any extra to enforce them. Yes. And so applying Lord Mance's test. You're not entitled to any security. Well, Lord, Lord Mansis says is the extra burden, with respect, he's, he's, he's addressing the question of the extra burden, as my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent put, the extra burden of you, SpiceJet, being in India, not within a treaty but state. But there is none. If they were in a treaty state, there wouldn't be any extra costs. It makes no difference whether they, in both cases, there'll be no extra costs of enforcing the appeal costs. Yes. Well, my Lord, the, the, the ultimate justice from which my, my, my submissions flow are that SpiceJet are in breach of a uh, order below. We have a judgment sum. Interest is accruing uh, as we speak, uh, which they've refused to pay. Mm. Uh, ultimately, the question is, should we be required uh, to add to that judgment sum another 200? That's the consequence of the fact that they've got permission to appeal. The costs are going to be incurred. Well, it, it is also a consequence of permission to appeal that there is jurisdiction and a discretion to obtain yes. uh, security. And then Lord Mance has said what the conditions are. Yes, and the, 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 the extra burden is by reference to the fact that they are in a non no, but how, state. And sorry, the extra burden, you have to look at the extra burden and say, is that extra burden, does that extra bur burden arise because they're in India? But if there is no extra burden, it doesn't matter where they are. Well, my lord, I think th th there is a, with respect, there is a conflation between yes. the uh, legal basis for the discretion and the avoidance of non-discrimination. Because Lord Mance is starting yes. from the proposition, you would get security in, in, in this scenario, but for the non-discrimination principle. And when met with the non-discrimination principle, the court's answer is, well, there ought to be security, but not in every case of a foreign dependent, because we have treaty Yes. Uh, arrangements, and that's how Lord Mance's principle accommodates the English law desire to give security 
in the situation, but not to discriminate against those. So, say, if, if, if the appellant was an English company, there would be no extra costs of enforcing the appeal cost, the appeal. Mother, yes. If they're an Indian company, there are no extra costs of enforcing the appeal cost. So the only reason you are, we would be ordering security against them is because they're an Indian company, which seems to me to be entirely contrary to the discrimination principle. Well, 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 my lord, either we're within the, the, the NASA uh, principle uh, in, in, on the basis that uh, we are not seeking the, uh, uh, the, the, the costs on the basis that, uh, simply the appeal costs on the basis that we, we won't face an extra burden and, and they are as if they were in England or in a treaty state. We are seeking the costs on the basis the extra burden to enforce the appeal cost. Set, set aside the 42 million for a moment because we, we would be entitled to enforce those appeal costs. Sim, 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 simply put, if we choose to... You would never spend £432,000 to enforce the costs of no, 200000 I mean, that's the point. The, the point my Lord is making is regardless of where the defendant is, extra costs of enforcing the costs order as well as the judgment are nil, because you're going to be enforcing the judgment anyway. Well, it doesn't matter whether the defendant is here, or there, or in outer space. You are not going to spend any more money, nor would you have done, if they were an English company, enforcing the costs order, because you're not going to enforce the costs order separately. You're not going to make a separate application. You're just going to roll in the 200,000 costs into your 42.5 million dollars. Yeah. And it won't add anything. So well, if that's right, being in India doesn't add any burden to you, as compared with being in England, of the costs of enforcing the costs order looked at separately, because there are no with, separate with, costs. With respect, that's not quite right. The execution petition that has been lodged is in respect of the order of Sir Michael Burton. If we are to enforce your Lordship's order in due course, a new execution petition will need to be lodged. Mm -hmm. That okay. will then, and, and your Lordship will see, because I'm asking for permission for, to, to reduce the objection, and there are specific objections taken to Sir Michael Burton's order, and those will have to be resolved in, in, in India. If we have to come to enforce, yes. But w what points arise in relation to your lordship's order if you dismiss the appeals and make a cost order in India will be at large. And given what we've seen from SpiceJet at the moment, with respect, my lord, I don't think it's right to say that you won't have a single penny extra I in order to. But no, enforce but nobody's identified any extra costs for us. I, I beg your pardon. No, you haven't identified what the extra costs might be. Well, my lord, again, this is all just in the realm of further estimates. My, my own friend has said your uh, uh, estimate of costs is conjecture as to what may or may not happen in, in India, and I'll come to that in, in a moment. But uh, in order to identify what, what are the costs, it, it, there's no difference in principle. The, the process that's set out by Mr. Ashar, which is we have an execution petition, we have a judgment from England, and then there is a process that goes all the way potentially up to the Supreme Court with all the delay and all the costs. In principle, there is no reason why if we come up with another execution petition in January 2023 based on your Lordship's order, that we will not have the same process whereby Mr. Shah's clients will then have an opportunity to put in objections, uh, uh, file or not file affidavits, appeal uh, uh, whenever they feel like, and before you know it, you're off to the Supreme Court in 2025 or 2027. So is your case it could, that you could have the same execution costs for the appeal? N no reason in principle at the moment. But I haven't, seen, I haven't seen that said anywhere. It's not said. It's, it's not said. I, 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 I'm saying this uh, on my feet in answer to your Lordship's question, but I see no reason why Mr. Ashar uh, can simply amend the execution petition, add it in, and we don't have a... Well, we just don't know that. Maybe, Milo, maybe you can just add, amend the petition. Mother, that, that, that may well be right. Maybe Mr. 
trial were given undertaking that his clients wouldn't object to that. My lord, they, they may be. So my lord, I, I think... Uh, I mean, to be fair, this isn't a point that Mr Shaw has taken. Out, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so my lord, so, so, uh, yes. <laughs> so my lord, uh, ne ne nevertheless, I mean, uh, beyond what I've just said, I, I, I would say I do pray in ethics that this is a deliberate breach of the order, and I'll come on to make good my submission. Do you see how it's relevant to the, the cost of the appeal, though? Well, uh, my lord, the the, the the question ultimately is whether we, having won below, mm. should have added to our bill that we're going to enforce a further uh, uh, set of costs. Well, we know given that, that we have won, we know that you will have that added. You will have the cost added. Well, not if we're secured. If you win, you have the cost added. Yes, we will. We will get costs, and the question is whether we should be secured yes. against that risk. Yes. Uh, uh, where we're not secured. I understand the. And if, you, if your the, lordships consider that it is simply unjust, then. Well, that fact, but that, unfortunately, what is now regarded as unjust is is prescribed by what Lord Mant said, isn't it? In that case. Well, the, the, the test is a broad one. It is what is just in all of the circumstances of the case, yeah. and in my submission, there is no principle objection in terms of justice to our case. If your lordships are not persuaded that it is just in all the circumstances, then, then so be it. And I understand your lordship got a factual point, which is you're an appellant, you've already got a judgment sum, and you're, you're going to be incurring costs anyway. Can't you just add it for free uh, on, on top? To which my point is I don't think that assumption can be made as a matter of fact. But uh, I, I don't accept that there is some uh, principle reason why well, the general position is if you're applying for security for costs it's for you to show what the extra costs or enforcement will be um, in relation to that this, these appeal costs and it seems to me you haven't done that and you've referred to the costs of enforcing the main judgment but th that obviously doesn't help you because um, we just don't know to what extent uh, the appeal costs will be um, encompassed within that or, or not. I mean, it seems to me the simple answer may be that so far as you need to show it, you haven't. My Lord, uh, th there were four objections that SpiceJet made, and I was proposing yes, to, you wanted to address those. Your Lordship, you 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 if your Lordships don't feel I've uh, overcome the, uh, the, the justice uh, uh, hurdle, then um, uh, those uh, objections uh, obviously uh, dwindle in importance. But I, I would say that even if I can't get home under uh, CPR 2513-2A, I still make the same submissions under my strikeout order. Your Lordships have a jurisdiction, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but you can also order security for costs if uh, you consider that there is a compelling reason for... Um, uh, I understand maybe we have a jurisdiction, but the idea that we would say you can't have security for costs, but we will order it, we, the court be struck out if they don't provide security for costs, I think would be well, a strange route. Uh, well, my lord, my lord, yes. So I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Yes. And uh, just before we leave this point, do we do we have a, um, a draft schedule of costs for the appeal justifying the figure? You've come forward with? So on the two hundred fifteen thousand, we have a paragraph of Mr. Hawthorne. We don't have a full right. uh, estimate on well, the quantum. Point, point me at that. So uh, Mr. Hawthorne uh, sets this out at. Um, in his latest witness statement at tab 5 at paragraph 46 which is at 36 Thank you. and he says it's £60,000 of solicitor's fees, £150,000 for counsel fees and £5,000 for miscellaneous disbursement. What's, what's so the estimate for the appeal? The time, pardon? What's the time estimate? For the appeal? One day. So um, Spice have said your estimate is too high for a one-day appeal. And my answer to that is obviously you know, estimating the costs of an appeal. Your lordships will have your own views based on experience about what is a reasonable set of costs. But I would say this: the, the, the submission that two hundred fifteen thousand pounds is unreasonably high should be rejected in circumstances where SpiceJet today have come to your lordships with a bill of costs for today's two-hour hearing of £137,000. Where, where's 
that. Is that in the bundles? It's not in the bundles, but um, yeah, I'm not sure I've seen it. Yes, but I think, but, but, but I don't, I don't want to take it no, into no, detail. If Mr. Shah thinks I've got the number wrong, he'll tell me. But they've submitted 137,000 pounds for today's two-hour hearing. In those circumstances, my submission is that a one-day estimate for the substantive appeal itself of a third more, 215,000 pounds, is not, in my submission, unreasonable. Your lordships can make of that submission uh, what, what you will. But oh, that, I, I mean, we did ask to look at the core bundle, and I have read the, the judgment under appeal. There is one point of construction. My lord, yes. It, is it really going to take a whole day to argue? It, it didn't seem to me to be a very long point. My lord, you, you, you may be right. It, it, it's one of those cases where half a day uh, may be too short, but a day is su w w well sufficient. So I don't think we're going to exceed a day, no. and, and we may not go uh, much beyond the half a day, but it was certainly, in our view, appropriate to set aside one day. But it is, my lord, a short point. Thank you. Once we've read the document. So, my lord, uh, 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 th there is the point about stifling, and I'll come on to stifling because that's relevant to my other uh, application. And there's also a point about oppression. It said that my security cross application is oppressive. But in my submission, if your lordships are persuaded that stifling has not been made out, there's nothing added by... Uh, but well, it's always... I was going to say about the same thing. Uh, and, my lord, there is also a suggestion that we've delayed our security for costs application. It should have been made before Burton J. But in the light of your lordship's observations about the Indian law evidence, about extra burden, it is uh, 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 completely unrealistic yep. to suggest that we should have prepared all of this evidence before it's just burden. And, indeed... It is clear in the authorities, and I don't need to take you to it, but in Morris, paragraph 6, the Court of Appeals practice is set out, which is to reject security for costs applications which are filed before permission to appeal is granted. So I, actually the position is stronger for me. I am required to wait until we know what the uh, compass of the appeal is. And I couldn't know what the compass of the appeal was until Mr Shah filed his appellant's notice, because it could have been three, four, five extra yep. grams. And then I wouldn't know what the estimate I should be putting before your Lordship was. So that is uh, hopeless. So, my Lord, it really does come down to um, uh, the point that we've been uh, debating about whether it is just or not. Give me the four, the four points. Delay, oppression, stifling, and what's the... The, the fourth point is the quantum point that we've been talking quantum. about. M M Mr Shah's two points. He says, I don't accept your estimate of Indian costs, to which the answer is, well, you haven't put any evidence in to say that our estimate is uh, is off. Uh, and then the second point is £215,000 is too much, yeah. to which I wish you have heard what I've had to say about that. I mean, the stifling point in the con in the context solely of the appeal costs, Quite. it takes a bit of swallowing, given that well, well, look, there's no difficulty in Mr. The, Charles Clark the pursuing the appeal themselves. It's always quite difficult to say, we can afford lawyers, but we can't pay for yours. The, the, yeah. the, the, the short point I was going to make which I'm perhaps I'll make it down in light of the Lordship's observation, was SpiceJet have actually submitted in their skeleton argument that there is a risk of stifling in respect of the security for appeal costs. Yeah. But that's not the test. The test, and I'll take you to Gold Trail shortly, has SpiceJet established on the balance of probabilities yeah. that an order to pay £215,000 would stifle the appeal? And the answer to that, your Lordship, can work out. Not, you don't even need to go to the evidence. Uh, SpiceJet has paid £342,000 in my costs below, uh, on time. SpiceJet incurred £370,000 of their own costs below. SpiceJet has incurred £137,000 today at a two-hour hearing. And they've also incurred costs in India on the episode, uh, to put it neutrally, that your Lordship has seen with the... Uh, execution petition. We have incurred sixty-four thousand dollars on that episode to date. So it may well be that the six hundred thousand dollars that we've estimated may turn out to be uh, an underestimate. And SpiceJet is also defending two commercial court substantial claims as we speak. So in those circumstances, it's not a surprise that SpiceJet does not say we cannot pay two hundred fifteen thousand pounds because they can. Is the short answer. So, my lord, let me move on to the conditional order. Yes. My lord, 
Uh, our application to strike out the appeal, unless Spicejet pays into court the judgment sum, or I should add any other sum that your lordship uh, determine appropriate, yes. is made under CPR 5218-1A. Uh, uh, unless your lordship need, need me to take you to the uh, provision, uh, I see. Uh, well, it's really... nice to have it open, but I did, I did see it. In there. So, oh. so the, it's, it's actually in the authority bundle as, as well, but it's in the white book, mm -hmm. uh, authority bundle tab uh, 15, uh, page 196. So we rely on subparagraph A. The test under the rule is expressly in subparagraph 2 which is, is there a compelling reason to do so? Now, SpiceJet has objected to our application on the grounds, they say, it is an application which circumvents sub or, uh, paragraph three, which provides that a party present at the permission hearing may not subsequently apply under subparagraphs B or C. Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, SpiceJet's point is rather difficult to understand, as, as set out in its Duncan argument, because it does not identify whether it contends that the court has no power to grant the relief sought under subparagraph A, or whether it submits that the discretion, if it has the power, under subparagraph A is implicitly subject to the prohibition in paragraph 3. Now, before I go to the authorities, I should submit that neither submission, if made, is, un is tenable. CPR 5218 plainly confers a power to strike out the appeal notice, and as Lord Justice McCombe uh, has held in Morris, which I'll show you shortly, he held that the power includes, the power to strike out includes a power to strike out unless something is done. And paragraph 3 expressly excludes subparagraph A. And so in, their in those circumstances, because of the express terms of the rule, there is no warrant for either denying the existence of the power or to curtail the exercise of that discretion by reference to paragraph 3. So that's my first point. But perhaps my better point is to go to what Lord Justice McCombe has said about this argument in uh, Morris. So if your lordships have uh, the authorities bundle tab 9, I think it is worthwhile to look at Morris. Yeah. And the point I'd make just before we get there is that the decision of Lord Justice Longmore in Spa Shipping, which my learned friend recites uh, extensively in his Skeleton Argument, is expressly considered by Lord Justice McCoon. Can you tell me what the current law is on whether we, sitting as two of us, are bound to follow what Lord Justice McCoon, sitting alone, has said? Uh, off the top of my head, I do not believe that your lordships are bound by Lord Justice McCoon, uh, but uh, because he is one and you are two, but you you are bound by the ratio of the two judge court in contract facilities, which was a decision which held that the court's case management powers and or CPR three point one. It's not clear that there was a decision under A. In that case, it was held that the uh, appearance at the permission hearing and the application for conditions, which were rejected at first instance, does not preclude or provide any bar to a subsequent application under the 3.1 and case management powers. And that, I say, is binding, and it would be completely inconsistent with contract facilities for your lordship to hold, well, uh, I'm bound by a two-judge court, Lady Justice Hale and uh, Lord Justice Waller, giving the judgment of the court. It wasn't just Lady Justice Hale agreeing that CPR 3.1 and case management powers allow, uh, give the power to uh, uh, make these orders, uh, but yet uh, 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 there, there isn't the power... Uh, under uh, A. So I say Lodges and McCombe is right. He was right to follow uh, contract facilities and your Lordship should follow contract facilities and also agree with Lodges and McCombe. Okay. Um, so my Lord, the, um, the, the, the judgment, if you have that at uh, page 107, 
the single Lord Justice, Lord Justice Bakum, in November 2016. The paragraph two, uh, you can pick up that the defendant in that case was a Swiss entity in the canton of based in, in Zug. My Lord, uh, then paragraph five, you'll see paragraph four, there was a default judgment and two arguments were made to set aside the default judgment. One was service, was irregular, and one was that there was a good defence. Uh, the judge, at first instance, rejected both arguments and ordered the defendant to pay costs and refused a stay of execution. Paragraph five is in, six is important. Uh, the defendant applied for permission to appeal. Shortly thereafter, uh, the claimant solicitors lodged an application for security for costs. They were informed by the court the application was premature, presented prior to permission for an appeal, and been granted by that the application might be refiled when permission was granted. That's the point I made earlier about how we, we, we can't be said to have delayed. Then, my Lord, uh, paragraph seven, uh, the permission application came back uh, after refusal to Lord Justice Lindblom in court, who granted permission, but refused a stay of execution. And on that occasion, counsel for uh, the defendant appeared, as well as counsel for the claimant. Paragraph eight, uh, 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 counsel for the claimant said uh, he attended the permission hearing, but only made submissions at the invitation of the judge. And paragraph nine, Immediately following the grant of permission, Mr. Morris filed a respondent's notice and made three applications, one of which was security for costs, uh, and uh, also uh, the um, application for the appellant's notice to be struck out in the event that the uh, sums owing uh, were not paid. My Lord, then I think we can turn to paragraph 11 and actually turn over the page after the judge when uh, judge cites the uh, strikeout provisions at 109 uh, the judge says in the last three, four lines of paragraph 11 it will immediately be apparent that the provision in subparagraph 3 is material because uh, um, uh, Mr. Roger and his client were present before the judge who granted permission and did make short submissions <coughs> and the uh, uh, appellant's uh, submissions were it's now not open to the court to make the strike out or stay order by reason of paragraph three. Then at paragraph 18, after, uh, and um, it, your lordship will see at paragraph 15, uh, the um, judge uh, held that um, th there ought to be security for costs. Uh, the judge did say, it seems to me there are reasons to consider a judgment may well not be met or that the appellant may be unable to meet any judgment and it has arranged its affairs not necessarily to avoid a judgment, but its approach to arrangements to give the court grounds for thinking it would be difficult to enforce against any substantive assets. I think it's entirely just. So there, the judge is adopting the submission that I have made to you, and he, albeit he doesn't consider your lordship's point, but he's not suggesting that because I've got a judgment that I have to enforce anyway in Switzerland, that precludes me from uh, giving an order for security for costs uh, uh, of the appeal. So he orders security for costs, but then at 18 he deals with the strikeout application. I turn to the second aspect of the case, which is perhaps more difficult. And then he recites the argument that the appellant makes, which is uh, uh, the provision of sub rule one is not appropriate to enable this application to be launched because the uh, respondent was present at the permission application. Paragraph uh, 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 19, I don't think, is uh, material. Then at 20, Lord Justice McCoom says, the point is one that's been touched on uh, by this court on a number of occasions, most notably, and he refers to Experience Hendricks, which is a judgment of Lord Justice Longmore, and uh, where he did uh, give permission to amend to rely on subparagraph A, where an application wasn't originally made on A, it was made on, uh, under C, but that obviously met the, 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 the obstacle of paragraph three. And then uh, the decision that my learned friend relies on, spa shipping. And interestingly, Lord Justice Longmore uh, describes that decision. Longmore, uh, LJ, expressed the view that did not preclude an application under paragraph A. So his interpretation of that decision is it is no impediment or obstacle to uh, uh, my application. Paragraph 21, Mr. Cohen then, uh, for the appellant, objects that the point does not appear to have been substantially argued. So he's saying that it wasn't argued substantially 
in spa shipping, so he wants to uh, argue it again. And he says, take a more strict look at the rules and have a look at the white book. And he uh, recites a passage, the crux of which is set out, and spa shipping is referred to. And obviously that's no longer in the white book in the light of the decision of, Mr. Uh, of Lord Justice Limbaugh. Paragraph 22. Of course, the authors of the white book recognise that the court, as it says, has regarded the matter as being subject to general case management powers and other provisions. In my judgment, the spa shipping case does not go anything like as far as the white book editors would have us believe. It is an application on the facts of the particular case. I think it is of some assistance, over the page of 23, to note that Lord Justice Waller, as I say, giving the judgment of the court, which included Lady Justice Hale, as she then was, in contract facilities, he said the Court of Appeal has always the power to manage its own cases when confronted with a problem of this sort, and your lordships can read the passage there cited. But it's quite an important passage, isn't it? It is. Because um, it says circumstances during the currency of the appeal. Yes. But it, doesn't say, it says circumstances during the currency, so those circumstances must exist. It is not saying uh, I am precluded from looking at any circumstances that existed prior, but still exist. No, but um, one has to give some effect to um, sub paragraph three, and it, it would be a strange thing if a party can just simply come along with an unrestricted right to say, um, please now make it a condition of the appeal that the sum is paid in, when the rule expressly says that you cannot ask for it to be a condition of, the, of an appeal. It's got to be something more than just a condition of the appeal, hasn't it? My, my Lord, the, the mischief that three, paragraph three is aimed at is to prevent an appeal or re-argument. Your Lordship shouldn't be troubled. If we have one go, we shouldn't be entitled to have another go and rehearse the same matters again. But what the rule contemplates in that regard is that you shouldn't have an opportunity for another go. You had your opportunity. It doesn't, it doesn't say that you it doesn't say that you can't reapply to the Court of Appeal if you um, if you made an application to the judge. You can see you can see the logic of that. You could say you, if you've made an application before a first instance judge uh, for a condition and that's refused, you can't apply in the Court of Appeal because you've had your you had your go. It doesn't say that. It says if you had the opportunity either at first instance or in the Court of Appeal, yes, then you can't um, you can't further apply. In relation to B and C. B and C. So, but the, 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 your lordship's point doesn't doesn't address my express terms point, which is A is expressly excluded, and that's the point that Lord Justice Limblot yeah. then gets well, to. Yes, well, where that gets to is we can strike out the whole appeal if there is a compelling reason to do so. Yes, but you don't suggest there's a compelling reason to strike out the whole appeal, unless. No, no, but that's the point. You have to add the word unless. So, so my lord's point is. You're not really asking us to strike out the appeal. You're asking us to impose a condition. You're asking us to say, please make them pay £42.5 million pounds dollars into court. And if they don't strike out the appeal, and it is very difficult to conceive that that is any different from imposing a condition on the appeal going forward, which is... But that is precisely the argument... It, it, is, by pre the it is precisely, precisely the, argument. the argument that was put by the appellant also in contract facilities, and it is precisely the argument that was rejected by Lord Justice Waller and Lady Justice Hale. So your lordships are bound that you have the case management powers inherently, or under 3.1, and Lord Justice Limblom, essentially for the same reason, it will be inconsistent with that decision and the express terms of the paragraph we're looking at, for you to then conclude, but we can't do it under A. Well, in that yes. situation, or or that we should circumscribe the discretion. Now, your lordships have, it's not a discretion, it is a value judgment, 
as to whether or not there are compelling reasons. And that's a separate question. But what I'm being faced with here is the argument, either your lordships haven't got the power, or implicitly the power under A could be subject to a fetter. And my submission at this point, before we get to compelling reasons, is that is wrong. Matter of construction and as a matter of uh, principle, and for the reasons, and I haven't finished uh, Lord Justice Limbaugh's argument, because he addresses the point... When you say Limbaugh, you mean McCoon, do you? I beg your pardon, uh, uh, Lord Justice McCoon, who then goes on in 24. He says that imposing the restriction that it does in paragraph 3, the rulemaking body expressly excluded the power under A, and it seems to me it did so for a very good reason. Of course, at the permission stage, things are fresh, and the question of imposing conditions, C, may well arise. But as time goes on, the court must retain, in my view, a power of control and proceed before it and if an appropriate case is brought before it, as appellant's counsel recognises, there sometimes there must be a power to strike out. And this is the point, addressing your lordship's point, and a strike out power, to my mind, always includes, as the uh, respondent submitted, a power to strike out unless something is done the less draconian is obviously included in the more draconian. Now, paragraph 25, Lord Justice McCombe says, this is not carte blanche to allow a, 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 any application. He says, I recognise uh, what Lord Justice Longmore said, which is the power should be exercised, can, can be draconian, and should be exercised in, and he uses the words, in compelling circumstances, probably a paraphrase of the words, a compelling reason. And um, the judge was directed to authorities, which uh, I will wish to take you to, Hammond Saddards and Lord Justice uh, Christopher Clark, uh, his judgment in Merchant International, and those factors are there set out, which uh, I, I will rely on in due course. But um, the judgment went on at paragraph, uh, top of paragraph 25, uh, for your lordships to take into account. If your lordship were to find you did have an opportunity to make this application before Sir Michael Burden. You should have made this application before Mr. Justice Burden. There is no good reason why you shouldn't have made that application before Mr. Justice Burden. I accept that's a relevant matter for your Lordship to make the value judgment. But what I resist is the submission that uh, your Lordship has no power or that artificially para three should be should come through the back door where the rulemaking body expressly decided no a is not subject to uh, three and at 28 paragraph 28 sorry uh, paragraph 26 the judge decided Lord Justice McCoon said to my mind there is a compelling reason to make an order of the type applies for first there are the circumstances affecting the financial affairs of the company and then he says that there's not just been a refusal but refusal of a stay on three occasions in this case there's been a refusal of a stay on two occasions. Uh, and at 28, he says, in the circumstances, the question is what to do. I consider there is proper jurisdiction uh, under A, and the compelling circumstances have arisen for the reasons I have uh, expressed, and he made that order. Now, my Lord, I think I do need to take you to, because of the concerns that you've raised, I think it is helpful to go to contract facilities. Yeah. yeah. And you'll also find that at tab four. And so this was a strikeout application unless the costs were paid. And as I say, so far as I can glean from the report, it was made under either CPR 3.1 or the inherent case management powers. It's not entirely clear, but uh, that, that is what I, I can glean from the report. There is no express reference to uh, uh, the power under A as being the uh, basis. So, so the... The judge below had dismissed a claim by the appellant. Yes. I was going to take you to the judgment to, 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 to explain. So paragraph four, yes. you'll see that uh, the judge at paragraph one dismissed uh, a claim with costs. Yes. And then at paragraph four, it's relevant that the defendant then made an application after uh, permission to appeal had been granted. The defendant made an application to the judge that he should reconsider the permission to appeal in the light of some evidence, and make permission to appeal conditional on the payment of the costs. And four lines up, you can see, the judge refused that application. So it was clearly made and rejected. Yeah. And then at um, paragraph 18, yeah. 
So a paragraph 15, you can see the application that was before the court was either dismissal of the appeal by reference to conduct or, more realistically, an order that the cost be paid uh, or the appeal. So that's effectively unless order uh, or the appeal be dismissed. So paragraph, after reciting, so the, the appellant recite, referred to 52.9, which was the predecessor to 52.18, yeah. uh, the uh, appellant had two prongs to his argue, attack by reference to 52.9. First, he says permission to appeal was granted when the response were present. So that's the paragraph three point. And he argues paragraph three prevents an application to impose conditions. And secondly, he said the response had made an attempt to vary the order and uh, that was uh, rejected. Uh, uh, Mr. Reeves for the appellant relies again on 52.93. But in addition, suggests that even if 52.9 does not apply, to prevent the conditions now being imposed, it would be wrong for the court to entertain what is in effect the same application rejected by the judge. And uh, the, uh, the learned law justices said this at 21. The Court of Appeal has the power to manage its own cases. It will be very strange if CPR 52.9 prevented the Court of Appeal imposing conditions under its case management powers where circumstances during the currency of the appeal made it appropriate either to stay the appeal or stay the appeal subject to conditions. And then there's a citation to the great future case. And I, I don't think I need to uh, invite your lordships to uh, read in detail that citation. But at 22, the conclusion is expressed. It seems clear, uh, the, the only point to make on the, uh, on the, um, on the uh, uh, great future case is that there's recitation of the powers under CPR 3.1. Uh, and uh, 22, it seems clear that the Court of Appeal has case management powers in addition to those that it may have under CPR 52. Further, it seems to us that the application is now before us is an application made during the currency of an appeal where the court is being asked to consider whether to exercise its case management powers by reference to conduct while the appeal is pending. Yes. That is totally different from the application before Judge Weeks. In our view, the Court of Appeal is jurisdiction, and it is not inappropriate to make the order uh, asked for. And to see what the conduct was, we will return to paragraph 27. Paragraph 27. First, the uh, appellant had, uh, the, uh, uh, the individual in control of the appellant, had financed the trial process or well, been a part of it. Let's see paragraph 26. It's a quotation, so I see. Paragraph 27, which should be at 55, page 55. Yes, I see. Thank you. So, there's a, the, the second sentence, mm. Mr. Shuck had financed the whole of the trial process or been a party to the financing. So that's the person controlling the appellant. So that, that doesn't seem uh, something that's uh, sprung up during the currency of the appeal. Secondly, this is a case in which Section 51 application must stand a considerable prospect of success. So that was, again, a reference to a matter that had been ventilated and arising during the uh, first instance procedure. Third, it's an appeal, and that places case management powers in a different context. Fourth, this is not a case where the respondents are seeking to inflate the pool against which they can later execute any judgment. Their position is Mr. Shuck had financed the trial and is financing the appeal. There's no reason why he should be allowed to conduct the appeal on a heads. He wins and a tail, they lose basis. And at paragraph 29, you can see that the order therefore was made, setting out the conditions on which the appeal should be pursued. We don't have the precise terms at hand. But what matters is the um, reasoning and the decision of the court, which does not seek to impose some type of uh, bar or fetter, but leaves the matter uh, at large for the court to consider, uh, notwithstanding an application was made below. So we would submit we're a fortiori where we did not make an application uh, below, and as I'll come on to submit, nor could we have made this application before Mr Justice Burton. It's completely unrealistic and uh, impractical to suggest that we should have. Now, I I'm not going to take you to spar shipping, conscious of the time, but also uh, because uh, Mr Shah no doubt will make submissions on it, and I uh, can deal with that in uh, reply if necessary. But the only point I make about spar shipping, in addition to the points that Lord Justice McComb has made, which is it doesn't stand for any proposition that poses an obstacle or a bar to me. Indeed, it supports me because it it says or proceeds on the basis the power does exist. Spar shipping, the application in that case, 
was brought under subparagraph C. And so that was expressly caught by paragraph 3, but the respondent sought permission to appeal. And that was the application uh, to amend, sorry, to rely on A at the hearing itself. And that was the application that Lord Justice Longmore was actually dealing with. And he decided in the exercise of his discretion on the facts of that case, see paragraphs 25 and 30, that he wouldn't give permission to amend. So it does not stand for any proposition of law as to the construction of the power or the discretionary principles under sub paragraph A. He just simply refused permission to amend on the facts of that case. So that's why SPA does not uh, affect any of the analysis. And uh, as I've said, uh, Lord Justice McComb uh, uh, came to the same conclusion. Can I ask you about paragraph 19? Um, so 19 of? Of um, contract. Yes. Uh, um, where it's re the reference to Lord Justice Ricks's view. Yes. Is that that's not a point you take, and it's not has that now been? That's no longer a viable argument, is it? Well, I, I'm not taking that point. You're not taking it. No. Uh, Lord has it, Justice has it, has it been dealt with anywhere. Lord, Lord, Lord Justice uh, Longmore refers in Spa Shipping to the fact that um, it may be uh, L Lord Justice Dyson in a subsequent case called Medical Facilities referred to ERAM as, uh, in a different context as, as not being uh, something that should be followed. So I, I, I wouldn't invite your Lordship yes. to adopt what Lord Justice Ricks has said. Uh, yes, thank you. It was New Lord Newberger. In medical justice. So, my lord, that, that's our um, uh, submission. Just the, the, the simple point um, uh, I'd make on the if your lordship said, well, we, we, we still think we've got to deal with the argument that you could have and should have made this argument before Sir Michael Burton, my, my simple submission is the, the thrust of our application is based on the burden, delay, and costs of Indian enforcement, and it is based on the detailed evidence that you've seen from Mr. Shah. And if your lordships give me permission, also on SpiceJet's attempt to relitigate the merits of the Burton order in India in the enforcement action, neither of those matters could or should have been ventilated before Mr. Justice Burton. I can give you the chronology, but put very shortly, we got a draft judgment on the 17th of February. We received a stay application from SpiceJet on the 19th of February, late on a Friday afternoon. One business day later, on Monday the 22nd of February, we served our evidence in response to the stay application. And then, uh, perhaps auspiciously on my birthday, on the 23rd of February, we were heard by Sir Michael Burton on all of the matters that were contentious, including the stay application. And it's simply unrealistic to suggest that in that time frame, dealing with everything we were dealing with, we should have gone off and made these applications. Permission to reveal obviously hadn't even been granted, and uh, we should have filed the evidence of Mr. Ashar. And of course, we couldn't even have uh, got the evidence about their objections, because as you'll have seen, that is only arisen very well. So, well, then I was proposing to turn to is there a compelling reason? Because that is what I need to establish. Uh, my Lord, again, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Yes. Your Lordships have the, the, the law as to what is a compelling reason is set out by Lord Justice Christopher Clark in Merchant International. And I'll give you perhaps the references rather than... But that's a 1C case, isn't it? It is. But your Lordship will recall that the test is the same under... Uh, paragraph 1. Sub paragraph 2 says these orders, that's A, B, and C, are subject to the compelling reason test. There cannot be, in my submission, any, yes. any reason why, if you have the power under A to do what a court has granted under C, 
see Lord Justice McCoon, see Lord Justice Waller in the two cases I've referred to, then the principles upon which you exercise that discretion, sort of form that value judgment, I mustn't use that word discretion, must be the same, because the test is the same. It's the test in, subpar in paragraph two. Is there a compelling reason? Well, yes, but the things that Lord Justice Christopher Clark are addressing, as summarising the passage quoted in paragraph 25 of um, Morris, he's considering whether there's a compelling reason to make it a condition of permission to appeal that the judgment sum is paid in. Yes. But that's not what we're considering under A. We're considering whether to strike out the appeal. Unless. Unless. Yes. But in, 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 in substance, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not submitting that what we are seeking under A is somehow subs substantively di different in principle, albeit it is a different power. It's the same if I came to you under 3.1. Or if I came to you under your inherent case management powers under contract facilities, I, I, I can't be submitted. Well, that's uh, a different principle. Your lordship's discretion. Or your, your, your no, but Mr. Dean, I think the difficulty that I, I see with it is this: it, it, is that one is when one is looking at one C. Yes. One is saying, uh, should we grant this party permission um, to appeal? And, and, and should we make it a condition of so doing that they pay the judgment sum or part of it into court? Yes. And, and there you have the whole aspect of all um, that that, that uh, they are going to be um, further praying aid the court's uh, jurisdiction when they are, in this instance, based in India and the assets are not readily enforced. Mr. Hammond Sardar's etc. Yes. Yes. So you can say it should be a condition of that. That if they want to take this further, basically they've got to pay. They've yes. got to put their money up, money. Uh, and that's all, all entirely well understood. Yes. Um, but when one comes to A, yes, there's a difference. This is now a party that has unconditional leave, to, unconditional permission to argue an arguable point, and one's no longer. You can no longer say, well, should they have to put this money in as a condition of bringing the because that point is definitely gone now. You cannot, by virtue of sub rule three, simply say that they should as a condition of appealing. There has to, it seems to me, be something more that justifies um, striking out a, an arguable point of law for which permission has been granted um, unless the money is paid in. It's a different context, a different scenario. My submission is that I, I don't accept that, my lord. Uh, my submission is that the law is set out in Merchant International as to what is a compelling reason is uh, equally applicable to uh, A. The, uh, your lordship's point about well, if that's the, the case, and there's no, and that, that's the case, then one's completely ignoring sub rule three. You say it's, a, you just say it's exactly the same test as. Exactly the same test as well, your lordship's five. argument is with the, the the rulemakers that they ought to have actually said not just B and C they ought to have said A B and C. No, no, because A A is undoubtedly uh, that the inherent power or recognised in the rule to control the appeal as it goes through. I mean, there may be a change of circumstances, or there may be something egregious happens which would require you to strike it. I mean, you can't say, for example, like relitigating the merits. Well, there may be a decision of the Supreme Court which makes the appeal unarguable. Yes, but my, my point is relitigating the merits in India, trying to reopen a decision uh, that is res judicata. That, that well, for my, for my part, I mean, you are, I'm afraid you really are running out of time because it's <laughs> only a two hour appeal. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think maybe starting with security for costs on reflection may not have been the right thing to do, but um, the. Um, for, for my part, I'd have thought that you would have to show something has changed from the, um, the point at which you could have asked the permission to be conditional. Because the appellant now has unconditional permission. You are going to come along and say, well, this, this appellant who's going to, going to appeal in relatively short order if Sir Michael Burton had had his way shouldn't be allowed to do that anymore unless they pay it all in. 
seems to me that's going to require some change of circumstance, is my view. My, my Lord, that's, I think, effectively my uh, learned friend submission. I, I, I don't uh, uh, accept that. My submission is merchant international it is what I need to establish. But if your Lordship is right, uh, then the change of circumstances I rely on is the reopening of the merits in India, and that is a matter for which I seek to uh, 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 rely on the objections, and perhaps I can uh, show that uh, to you uh, and seek uh, explain why I seek permission to rely on it. So, my Lord, that is at tab 17 of the bundle. And you see at 308, just so you've got the context for this. So the um, your Lordship has seen the evidence of Mr. Ashar that effectively delay in India could be five to seven years mm -hmm. and costs of up to six hundred thousand US dollars, none of which, and this is quite important, none of which are likely to be recovered in India. And this is actually material for security for costs as well. The evidence is we are not going to be able to get an order to get a single penny of any of that money back. And that is an additional burden that we would have if we were in England, where we'd get a cost order as well no. for, for the enforcement. So that, that I pray. But SpiceJet has said, uh, we don't accept that, they say. Uh, they haven't adduced any evidence from an Indian lawyer to say, no, this is all nonsense, uh, and this is the position, and it will only take a year or two and cost you $100,000. What they have said in terms in their skeleton argument is what you say to Haviland is mere conjecture. And that's what then triggers our application for permission. Because what ha then happened is we filed our execution petition on the 3rd of June with the Delhi High Court. Now, suggested by Suffice Jet that we delayed. Uh, we've set out in the correspondence all of the mm -hmm. somewhat old fashioned reasons why. Uh, you know, wet ink signatures, apostilles, and embassy yeah. trips are required. So we didn't delay. We did it as soon as we could. On the 4th of June, the Delhi High Court ordered SpiceJet to file a reply to the execution petition within four weeks and file the affidavit of, asset, of assets uh, up to date on the 4th of June by the 5th of July. On the 1st of July, SpiceJet filed its objections, and those are at page 308. And the permission that we seek is to rely on paragraphs 41 of this very long document, which you really don't need to read in detail until you get to 344. And it's paragraphs 41 to 46. And if I can summarize it very briefly, what SpiceJet are contending in India is that the order of Sir Michael Burton is not a final and binding judgment on the merits because the finding on the penalty clause issue was a amounted to a breach of the Indian Contract Act and was violative of Indian Supreme Court decisions on damages. And what we submit that demonstrates is two things. One, it rebuts the contention that an obstructive attitude to enforcement by SpiceJet is conjectural. <coughs> it makes plain. SpiceJet are going to take every single point <coughs> available in India to make enforcement impossible. But the yeah. second point is this. SpiceJet's attempt on the, started on the 1st of July, to relitigate in India a point which is res judicata under English law and is not subject to this appeal. They sought permission to appeal from Burton, um, Sir Michael Burton, and they did not renew that application for permission before this court, and so it is now res judicata. That amounts to abusive conduct. It goes well beyond the legitimate tactics that a judgment debtor is entitled to adopt, and it provides a compelling reason for the order that uh, is sought. This evidence was not available before Lord Justice Mails gave his direction for obvious reasons, and now we seek permission to rely on it because we submit it highly material. And there's no prejudice, I should add, to uh, uh, 
that material coming in. That's as simple as that. So, my Lord, that, that's what we say. If you say, if you conclude you need a change of circumstances, that's my change of circumstances. So, in the ordinary course, you can, you can enforce an English judgment in India through an enforcement action. My, my lord, yes. Su su subject to the Indian provisions. Um, so they recognise an English judgment? In principle. Sub subject to, 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 to the statutory uh, objections. And one, one of the statutory objections, you can see this from um, page 344, uh, uh, 345. Section 13 of the CPC sets yeah. out when a foreign judgment is not conclusive, and one is where it has not been given on the merits of the case, and that is what they're saying. This judgment that we are appealing has not been given on the merits of the case, and indeed, th this is one objection that they're really litigating. Who is to say that after this appeal is dismissed, they can carry on with their relitigation of the penalty clause issue? Who's to say they couldn't relitigate your lordship's conclusion? If you conclude that the appeal is dismissed, they can have another go. And that the fact the fact is not that it's conjecture anymore. It's now clear that is their stance. Your lordship has the episode about the it's appeal. It's difficult for us though to to on this in, in this interlocutory environment, uh, looking at a foreign jurisdiction's approach to enforcement of an English judgment, start forming. Um, views as to the propriety of what is being done there. It's um, one thing. It's one thing if there are, let's say, procedural requirements. Let's yeah. say that the foreign court says we need a red stamp in wet ink on the judgment, and if you don't have it, you can't enforce in this jurisdiction. Mm. And you, I can understand your logic point. Well, how are we supposed to form a view that that's inappropriate or unjust? But we're in common law jurisdictions. India is a common law jurisdiction. This is a common law. There's no debate that relitigating a matter which is res judicata, and this should be viewed through English eyes. Your lordships are, this is an English court. This agreement was subject to English law, English jurisdiction. They agreed to come to England, yeah. and it is a judgment which has been finally passed and binding. The, the lawyers next to me accept that this is final and binding, but their client doesn't. In India, and the fact that you are doing one thing in England, proceeding on the basis that it is final and binding, except for the point that's before your lordship, mm -hmm. and then doing completely the opposite in India, whether you are able to do that in India or not doesn't matter. The fact is you are doing it, and that is abusive because relitigating a matter which is res judicata in this jurisdiction is abusive. Now, if, you, if your lordship, if Mr. Shah was to get up and say, well, actually, there's an argument that the penalty clause issue is not res judicata, then your lordship might be persuaded, well, maybe it's arguable, it's not, and then that might be a different thing. But it is plain as a pike staff that this is relitigation of the merits, a matter which is res judicata, and that is what makes it abusive. So your lordship doesn't need to be concerned about uh, comity and whether... Yeah. Uh, so this is, a new, this is an entirely new point argument now, Postdates your skeleton. It is by virtue of these documents having arrived uh, recently. Yes. Um, I see. Well, if I say postdates my argument. I, I set it out in my supplemental submission. Yes. I have made made the argument yes. when it as soon as it became aware. Yes. And again, I'm repeating myself, but it's not completely out of context. It's within the context of my existing application. But it's an additional limb that I say this is a change of circumstance that does justify yes. on its own and or in conjunction with what I've already said. But if your Lordship was saying, well, what you've already said might have been good enough if you'd uh, raised this before Burton J, but because you didn't raise it before Burton J, uh, we, we are cautious about uh, 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 allowing you to, 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 to win now. This changes everything, I submit, because now there is a clear yeah. abusive conduct which does justify the use of your Lordship's case management power. So that's what I say. The only other point that I just before uh, 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 sitting down is obviously I haven't addressed stifling. Mm. Now, um, 
as I've submitted, the test is, this is gold trail at paragraphs 15 to 16, 23G and 24, authorities tab 11, page 127 and 129. I'd invite you to look at gold trail. Can you, can you give me the page references again, sorry? So it's page, tab 11, yeah. page 127, 129. The paragraphs are 15 to 16, 23 letter G, and 24. The proposition that I rely on is that Spicekit must establish, to, to make good its stifling defence, on the balance of probabilities, payment of the judgment sum, or any lesser sum. Of course, your lordships have a... Uh, discretion to order a lesser sum, mm -hmm. but that that payment would stifle would stifle the appeal. Not risk, not could, it would. And when we are saying, because we are saying, they have been saying the monies can be raised from, amongst others, SpiceJet's wealthy founder, shareholder, and promoter, Mr. Ajay Singh. SpiceJet must also establish on the balance of probabilities that no such funds would be made available to it, whether by Mr. Singh or other persons. So that's Gold Trail. Gold Trail also says that the court should not take any emphatic refutation of those points by the um, uh, 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 respondent to the application at face value and should assess the position in accordance with the realities. The position is Mr. Singh has not given any evidence to your lordship, either about his ability to provide the financial support or his willingness. And I would draw your attention to Lord Clark's speech and Lord Carnworth's speech. They dissented in the result on Gold Trail, which was to remit the case back to the Court of Appeal to decide uh, the, the matter on the basis that there was a correction that needed to be made to the Hammond Suddard's factors, because Lord Justice Clark in Hammond Suddard's used the word could when he should have used the word would on factor number four. And what Lord Clark and Lord Kahn would say, they disagreed with the remission, and obviously this happens on appellate decisions, where um, they considered that the matter was plain, even if you corrected for the uh, replace would, not could, and Lord Carnworth makes the point that I rely on, the absence of evidence from the third party as the decision not to fund, that itself is fatal to the contention of stifling. And I adopt Lord Carnworth's reasoning at paragraph 48 in that regard. Your Lordships are well aware, I think um, uh, Lord Justice Nuji uh, uh, has recently considered the matter in the, I think it's the indemnity case, that the evidence required needs to be full, frank, clear and cogent. That can be found from Hammond Suddard's and Mahan Air, which is in the bundles. And put simply, SpiceJet's evidence is neither full, neither frank, nor clear. And there is no evidence from Mr Singh and in those circumstances, the uh, evidence fails to satisfy that high burden of stifling. And when your court, the court then is left with no stifling, you've got the fact of the episode. And I do pray in aid of this as another change of circumstances. Your lordships have the episode in which SpiceJet uh, uh, ex exceeded to Lord Justice Mail's direction that the uh, affidavit of assets ordered by the Indian court would be uh, exhibited in evidence. Three weeks after that order was made, after Lord Justice Mail gave that direction, <coughs> they decided to launch an appeal that they describe as urgent. My Lord, there was no urgency evident from waiting more than three and a half weeks after that order. What is clear is SpiceJet do not want to give your Lordships a full, frank and clear position on its financial position. Instead, they want to give your Lordships media comments on its financial position. That's fine if SpiceJet wants to do that, but they can't then ask your Lordships to find that there is stifling. 
And the manner in which this issue has been addressed, raising stifling, completely failing to satisfy the test, completely failing to be full and frank and clear with the court, is itself another reason, compelling reason, why your lordships, I submit, should be willing to grant the, this order. Final point before I sit down, and I appreciate I've been much longer than my uh, allotted time. We have also sought permission to produce a FD article, which is in the bundle. You can see uh, the references to it given in my supplemental skeleton. It arises because Mr. Sand, who's the in-house counsel for SpiceJet, in his second witness statement, he referred to an article that he wanted to rely on for uh, uh, asserting that the financial position was not good for SpiceJet. But in that article, it says that Mr. Ajay Singh, I beg your pardon, in that article it asserts, and this was in court, there was a reference to a court hearing by the Airports Authority of India suing SpiceJet and saying, SpiceJet are not paying the money and they're deliberately doing so, although they've got the money. And in that context, the uh, Council for the Airports Authority of India referred to a media report in which SpiceJet were referred to as a bidder for, air, for the acquisition of Air India, multi-billion dollar airline. Mr. Sand, who wants to rely on the article, pleading poverty, says in his second witness statement, but it is incorrect that uh, SpiceJet is a bidder. Now that is not full and frank and clear when you see the FT article, which we refer to and we seek permission to rely on it, the one article, well, there's plenty of articles, which refers on the, I think it's the 20, uh, 29th of June, 20, 29th of June, that Mr. Singh is shortlisted as a bidder for uh, Air India. And that again demonstrates Mr. Singh, either personally or through entities he controls, has the ability and willingness to provide the financial support. Again, that evidence from Mr. Sand is less than full and frank. Unless there's anything further, those are my suggestions. No, thank you very much. Yes, Charles. Uh, I'm going to deal first with the um, question of whether the uh, condition should be imposed on the appeal and then come to the security of costs uh, afterwards. Um, Lord, in relation to the application to adduce further evidence, uh, our objection is that we obviously don't have an opportunity to say anything in response. I thought Justice Mayles uh, didn't anticipate that there would be any reply evidence as such. But I'm, I'm not going to stand here and shut your lordships out from looking at it if your lordships consider that it's relevant to decisions you have to make. Uh, the evidence in relation to the uh, press report for Mr. Singh um, is in our submission not relevant to the test and the trail that you would have to apply. Uh, but in relation to the uh, proceedings in India, um, again, I'll, I'll take you to that document to show you precisely what my clients are saying and to make the broader point that actually uh, those are uh, points that are left to the Indian courts to resolve, and they are going to resolve them pretty quickly, uh, given the um, timetable. But obviously one of the points we've not had an opportunity is to update the court on the procedural timetable for that particular petition. So there's going to be a further hearing uh, in early September that we can uh, look at that. But my lord, um, I, I'm going to move straight on to, to the application to adduce, uh, uh, or, or rather to, to impose this condition. Uh, and my starting point, my lord, is that um, it should be refused because it is an impermissible attempt to try and impose a condition uh, under 50, uh, CPR 5218.1c. Uh, uh, and really, it's a backdoor attempt to do that. Uh, and your lordships have seen sub rule 3, which prevents um, the uh, applicant DHC from trying to impose conditions uh, when it was present at the permission stage. Uh, and my lords, what I hope to show you is that. Not only was this something they could and should have erased, but it was something that we actually brought to the court's attention uh, as, as a, in justification for a stay of execution, which um, was resisted, uh, resisted by the um, uh, Mr. Dillon, 
uh, on his client's instructions because they said they weren't seeking such a condition, to impose such a condition. And Lord, you've been shown the authority uh, on, on uh, the circumstances in which a condition has been imposed, might be imposed. Um, and can I just show you the spa shipping case? And it's the judgment of uh, Lord Justice uh, Lord uh, And that's the authority. <coughs> Divided ten. Um, and the Lord, effectively, this was uh, an application uh, where uh, the um, applicant sought to use the predecessor of uh, 5218 um, to impose conditions on an appeal, having not sought to impose it when permission was granted. And you can see at paragraph six um, that they were present uh, and that um, they had. Um, not raised any um, objections when the application for permission uh, was dealt with before the judge below. It's correct to say that uh, they had initially phrased the application as uh, one under CPR 59.1c and were not given permission to amend it. But in exercising the discretion not to give that permission, it's, it's clear that uh, Lord Justice Longmore um, had in mind uh, the uh, overlay of um, uh, CPR 52.183 with um, subrule. Uh, 1A and uh, C. My Lord, um, could I just invite your Lordship to see that uh, paragraph 13, and I just want to invite your Lordship to read, read that, uh, because it does um, stress, uh, as I think uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Phillips uh, said in argument to Mr. Dillon, that the nature of the order being sought is a very draconian one, uh, particularly uh, one where there is an appeal, an arguable appeal, uh, which, for which permission has been uh, given unconditionally. Then, my Lord, um, if one goes to paragraph 15 uh, of, of the judgment, uh, one sees there that the whole point uh, of 52.3 is to um, avoid precisely this sort of application uh, and the consequences that flow from it. Uh, and, my Lord, you just have to look at the fact that um, both parties have put in bills of cost for this application in excess of £100,000. It's taken the time and attention of three Lord Justices, if one includes uh, Lord Justice uh, Males, uh, and uh, two hours of court time and whatever judgment writing time will be taken. Uh, and all that is uh, contrary to the policy that's behind sub, sub Rule 3. Uh, and, and add to that um, is the delay that this has led to. Uh, and it's delay that has meant that uh, whereas the judge contemplated uh, that this appeal could have been dealt with by now, it's now not going to be dealt with uh, until possibly the end of the year. Uh, and um, one where certain my clients are, are prejudiced because there is... Do, a do you have a listing for the appeal? No, the, court, the listing office refused to list it until this application was determined. So we now go to the back of the queue, um, unless your lordships uh, are prepared to uh, direct some sort of uh, expedient and get a, a, a listing of the main appeal. So, my Lord, um, if one then turns on, could I invite your Lordship just to read paragraphs 20 through to um, 25? So, my Lord, uh, what, what we submit is that um, the, the, the test and the question you have to look at is whether there is conduct during the currency of the appeal that would justify you to um, strike out this appeal. Uh, and um, it's no good to try and for a party to make the application to say um, that, that, that um, we should have um, the judgments I'm brought into court for reasons um, that, that uh, were either known at the time or capable of being ascertained um, uh, at the time. Uh, and this question um, goes to your discretion in the exercise of uh, 51, uh, 1A, sorry, 52, uh, 18, 1A, uh, and also is a feature of whether you really can say there are compelling circumstances to uh, impose the re relief. And my Lord, just, just to bring into focus what was before the judge, because it is important that, that you understand 
had that. Um, it's right it came around um, quickly, but between um, the draft judgment and the handout. But that nonetheless can stop the parties being prepared to argue for permission to appeal, to raise the question of stay of execution, uh, and to flag whether any condition was going to be imposed on this appeal. But it will nearly always come around quickly. Exactly, my lord. And, and the expectation is that the parties that prepare... Well, it seems to be a party can, can say we want condition imposed, and if the result of that is it engages greater issues, then it, that question can always be adjourned exactly. for, for a consideration. My Lord, precisely. But, but we will see that actually it was quite the contrary. That we, the roles were reversed in a sense, because uh, as, I, as, gonna, as I'm going to show you, we, we, yes. we, we don't have the funds to pay the judgment, uh, and um, we, 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 we brought that to the attention of the court. Uh, my Lord, can I just show you, at, um, it's the supplementary bundle, uh, and it's uh, divider six. Uh, and within that divider, it's pages 60 and 61. So this is the submission of my lone friend, uh, Mr. Dillon, uh, and it's in response to our stay of execution application. Uh, and the submission made a paragraph 25 in particular it was that um, they, they, they accept and they submit to the court that the reality is that if the stay is refused, the cabinet is extremely unlikely to receive payment of the judgment debt in short order. Uh, and note statements in Christchurch's uh, financial results to the effect that companies looking to defer payments were possible therefore assume that enforcement action in India will be required, which is expected to take many years. And therefore, the prejudice uh, that was being argued before the judge was that uh, a stay would delay that, that enforcement. Uh, so one can see there's an anticipation that SpiceJet were not going to pay the judgment debt. There was an acceptance that our financial results indicated an inability to pay, and an anticipation uh, that they were going to enforce in India and that this was going to take uh, many years. So it's with those spectacles, my Lord, that you have to then approach this application that's being made. And my Lord, one then so turns... I hesitate to interrupt, my friend. If your Lordship could also read paragraph 26 of the same... Yes, document. I was going to then see. take you on to paragraphs 26 through to 28, where um, there was then evidence um, that, that suggested the financial position was not as dire as... Uh, we, we were uh, submitting, uh, but the answer uh, to that is that these are all contentions made within the accounts, the accounts that were before uh, the court. Uh, and then one, one sees there that um, the stifling argument was, was raised in paragraph 27 um, because of the injustice that the appeal is stifled because it lacks the means uh, if enforcement action is taken on the judgment for order. And then what the judge says is that, that this is found within the reality, uh, firstly, of the time for an appeal in India. Uh, secondly, uh, the submission was said to be misconceived. Um, uh, and thirdly, uh, the court is not being asked to uh, attach any condition to an appeal. Uh, so at this stage. Uh, at this stage. Uh, and so the primary evidence from Mr. Sand uh, uh, then deals with... Um, is directed to whether a condition was offered of payment into court of, of effectively the, the, the judgment debt. And the judge felt that that had no relevance. So, my lord, the effect of that submission and the position that was taken. Uh, you say this is what the judge thought. I thought this was a skeleton, not a judge. Uh, sorry, you're right. This is, this, this is um, a skeleton. Um, if one then um, turns on to um, uh, the, the, the judgment. But before I do that, the effect of that submission, my lord. Um, is, is effectively that, that, that uh, DHC was, was making its election not to uh, seek a, a, a condition uh, for the appeal. And the effect of um, uh, 52.3 means that they can't come back to the Court of Appeal and, at a later stage and try and ask it to do so. And they shouldn't be permitted to do so through the back door of 1A. And my Lord, um, that, that skeleton argument was supported by a witness statement of Mr. Hawthorne. That was his fourth statement of paragraph 18. I'll just give you the reference, given the time. Uh, but that's at um, tab 14 of this bundle at page 272. If one then sees 
uh, the, the discussion before. Sorry, which was the paragraph number? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Uh, paragraph 18. Okay. If, if one then sees um, the discussion before the judge, now we don't have a separate judgment on de dealing with some of the consequentials, but we can see um, how, how the transcript and, and how, how that went. Uh, and so, my lord, it's turning over to, uh, it's in the same tab, but turning on to page 82. And, and one picks it up at um, E to G of um, page 82, which is the transcript of, of, of the hearing before um, Sir Michael Burton. Uh, and um, this, now having given uh, permission to appeal, this is then where he deals with the question of whether there should be a stay of execution. Uh, and um, he makes the point at, at E to G uh, that, that effectively uh, our concerns uh, were not well made precisely because it was a short point of appeal uh, and they expected to come on quickly to be resolved. Uh, and then at uh, page 83, uh, C to E, um, he makes the point accepting what the um, claimants have said in their evidence before him, um, that perhaps the position is not as bad as it might have been. Um, that, um, that then comes to deal with the question of whether a condition uh, on appeal uh, would stifle it. Uh, and what Sir Michael Burton then says at D is that that may be, but if that is to come, it is a matter for them. And then he says he would have thought it unwise to do so uh, in order to get the hearing on to the Court of Appeal uh, quickly. And then at 85, what one sees, um, oh, if I get, again, if I could. Um, to your lordships, it's 85E through to 86F. Uh, one then sees that um, this discussion of um, effectively, um, again, this is still during the currency of the, the, the stay application. Uh, and what, what, what the judge then says is that um, at D, C, on page 86, that he's not minded to grant a stay. Um, but he was minded to say uh, that there ought to be this appeal ought to be brought on very quickly. Uh, and then it's at D to E that uh, the absence of the stay would actually be a, a spur uh, to my client to prosecute the appeal quickly um, uh, and resolve it as, as, as soon as possible without additional interlocutory matter. Uh, and that then led to the very helpful intervention by Mr. Dillon to shorten the time for us to uh, lodge the appeal. Uh, which we complied with. So um, it was clear and pragmatic <coughs> logic uh, in, in the judge's approach, which is the appeal is a short point of construction. Your lordship will form your, your own view as to the issue. Um, it's a determinative appeal, though, either way, because if we succeed, a judgment is set aside. This was a reverse summary judgment on both sides, mm. so point of construction on the case. Yeah. Obviously, if the um, appeal fails, then that's going to be the end of our, our, our argument. Uh, and then the final point is, in relation to the other part of the claim that's not being appealed, that's worth about seven-odd million, the um, defendants already have on account some seven million dollars that my clients have been paid under the contract. Uh, and, and so, in a sense, the, the permission to appeal, um, and whether or not uh, conditions uh, on, of the appeal were relevant, were all um, dealt with on the premise that this was a short point be resolved quickly and enforcement in India should proceed in accordance with uh, the rules that apply in India. Uh, and in a sense, the what the judge en envisaged would have occurred but for this application. Now, my lord, the, the, the test, therefore, um, moving on to um, the 52.181a, is whether there are compelling circumstances. Uh, and in this case, we would say, against that background, that there aren't any uh, compelling circumstances. Well, this, this application was made in March, isn't that right? It was made in March. So, the, so, so um, Sir Michael Burton determined these issues in... Um, 23rd of February. 23rd of Feb. And then this application is made on the 20... 23rd of May. March, sorry, 23rd of March. About a month later. A month later. Um, oh, Lord, can I take my wig off? 
Yes, yes, please do. Anyone who wishes to, it's very yes. awesome. Um, and the, um, and as I understand it, what is said at that point is, well, there are now three compelling reasons. Um, the they haven't paid the judgment yet, which everyone knew you weren't going to pay. Yeah. Secondly, there are going to be difficulties in enforcement, which everyone knew. And thirdly, you were going to spend money on English lawyers pursuing the appeal in England, which everyone knew. Yeah. So at that point, it seems to me really nothing had changed from in that in that period except that you hadn't actually paid the judgment. Correct. But big surprise. There is a big surprise that has been put in that skeleton argument, but um, well, there is. But so forgive me. At that point, it seems I don't have any difficulty for my own part with accepting your submission that re really this was a, a second bite of the cherry, which is arguably forbidden by uh, Sub Rule Three. What I think the I think the thing I'd really be interested to know is what about this new argument? Yes. saying that something now has changed because you are dirty dealing in India. Well, my lord, um, we would say that no, no, um, no, nothing has changed because um, the first point is uh, within the submission uh, and the acceptance that an appeal in India was going to take time, it was anticipated that my clients would um, uh, use whatever arguments were legitimately available in India uh, to, to um, resist enforcement. And, um, and that that would have to be worked through the Indian courts. That's why you have the, the built-in um, time frame. Uh, and in relation to, to what has happened in India, um, your, your lordships know that um, on the 3rd of June, the uh, claimants, uh, uh, GHC, made its application for its execution uh, petition order. That was 3rd of June? 3rd of June. They made the application, and they got a hearing the very next day um, in which um, the 4th of June order was, was made. Now, enforcement in India is subject to a bilateral treaty between India and uh, the UK, and that is set out in Mr. Ashar's statement, and I'll just give you the reference, which is SB, but the supplementary bundle is tab 7, page CO 92. So th there are defined rules uh, for, for enforcement, and uh, no doubt as a matter of Indian law, there are arguments that, that can be raised um, uh, and that, that, that are limited by, by those rules. The, 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 that petition was, uh, was heard promptly on the 4th. An order was made, which required my clients to file its evidence by the 5th of July. And it's that, 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 that response uh, that you've seen. So they have an opportunity, as a matter of Indian uh, law, uh, for enforcement of a judgment, to serve a response. Uh, and they've taken that opportunity. No surprise to, to what was anticipated. And then the, um, uh, appellate, uh, the, the uh, DHC has the opportunity to file a reply to that. Uh, and they were given, uh, initially they had two weeks, so I think they've asked for an extra three weeks. But that, that, that again is something that, um, that they will um, uh, take, the, take the opportunity. Uh, and then um, when that time frame expired on the 19th of July, my clients then have 14 days to file a further response. And then there's a hearing that is listed for the 8th of September 2021, dealing with this execution petition. So, so, so what you have before you is a process of enforcement in India, which is being followed through, and which is um, uh, being done with considerable expedition. I mean, this, this, this jurisdiction uh, would, 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 uh, couldn't criticise a petition that is filed on the um, uh, 3rd of June with, with pleadings effectively closed and a hearing by the 8th of September. Now, well, I think there's only one point they've raised, which is it says that you're taking, a, you're taking a point which we, as an English court, looking at it um, from this distance, can nevertheless say that that is, um, that is inappropriate and, and is such as to engage the court's jurisdiction to strike out the appeal? My Lord, you couldn't possibly reach that conclusion because it's, it's a matter that is current in the Indian courts and it's not for this court. Well, you wouldn't say that we couldn't in certain circumstances no, no, no. take that. No, but as a matter of discretion and, and given the timetable that I've just spelled out. Uh, this but what about the specifics? It's being said that you are seeking to reopen a point which is plainly raised judicata. 
Well, um, can, I, can I just show you what precisely how it's been put? Yeah. I think it's quite important that you see what we what we put before you. So I'm, I'm just trying to hone in on the yeah. the key. What I see the key point is well, the, because the, we're so short of time. The, I mean, yes, I'm sorry. But no. the, the key point is that the res judicata point um, is one that uh, is a matter for the Indian court to determine. Firstly, secondly, yeah. it is not strictly res judicata in the sense that we rely upon an Indian Act that um, obviously is relevant to enforcement because uh, the, the judgment um, has to be enforced as a matter of Indian law. Uh, so it's a, so it's, an, it's a defence to enforcement. It's a defence to enforcement. That even though it's a, an enforceable English judgment, correct. That it's con it, it, it conflicts with certain Indian law. Provisions. Indian laws. Now that's either a, a good point or a bad point. Um, and that's by virtue of the treaty, is it, or is it by virtue can of we, Indian can, law? Can we look at what you actually say? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at page three hundred and forty-five. So three hundred and forty-five, which sets out. Oh. Section 13 of the Code of Civil Procedure, which dates from 1908, suggests that it was drafted at a time when Indian procedure was modelled on English procedure. And you can see that two subparagraphs of Section 13 have been underlined, where it has not been given on the merits of the case, and where it sustains a claim founded on a breach of any law enforcing India. And then there's a reference to the Indian Contracts Act, which is very well known in the Victorian Act. But this claim, looking at it through our eyes, doesn't look to me like a claim founded on a breach of the Indian Contracts Act. Well, the Lord, it's, uh, it's, it's founded on a breach of a contract which is governed by English law and subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the English courts. I mean, that in England would be a hopeless conclusion. I mean, my Lord, I obviously am. Um, You're not an Indian lawyer. I'm not, I'm an, Indian not lawyer. an Indian lawyer. I, I can't comment on, on the scope and effect of. Um, Section 73 and 74 and, uh, and, uh, and their application. Um, and it may well, be you say you can't comment on the scope of 73 and 74, and I understand that, that those are matters of Indian law. But it, I don't see why you can't comment on the well, contention I, that the judgment, the foreign judgment, that's the Michael Burton's judgment, sustains a claim founded on a breach of a law enforced in India. It seems to me to be absolutely plain. Burton judgment is not founded, sustaining a claim founded on a breach of an Indian law. It's simply irrelevant what the Indian Contracts Act says. What, what, the, the claim is sustained because it's founded on a breach of English contract. I mean, I think the, the extent of the submission is set out at 42, um, which is that in, in effect the damages have been awarded. Um, with, without any assessment of, 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 of the loss uh, that's been suffered. Um, and so there's no, no, no proof of loss. Now, now whether that holds good as, a, uh, as an argument, my lord. Um, it isn't a claim for loss or damage, it's a claim for some due under invoices. Well, no, it was. Liquidated damage. It wasn't, it was a liquidated Liquid damage damages. Was oh, I see. arising upon termination. I see. Yeah. Uh, and there was a flat, flat rate of 2.5 million. Uh, and so. And my Lord, you, you will also see that. Um, the other grounds that are taken are, are the, obviously relying upon the fact that there is this appeal. Uh, and that raises a question as to whether the, the judge is a full, full and final um, judgment um, as a matter of Indian law. And again, one knows that different jurisdictions take different views as to the effect of an appeal uh, on finality. Uh, and um, then, then your lordship will see um, that um, this application is, 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 is then uh, referred to uh, paragraph 40 as being for attention to the Indian court. Um, It, it may be that um, in the eyes of this court, um, it is seen as a, a, a weak argument. It's maybe one that would get a short shrift before, before an, an English judge. But when you look at this document, it's not an improper document. Uh, and it is a document that is being put within uh, a procedural timetable 
that the Indian court itself has, has set out. It is no different from filing a defence on a point that you're advised on that is, is arguable but may, may not succeed. Uh, or indeed, maybe a defence that actually on analysis uh, wouldn't, um, wouldn't um, survive su summary judgment but, or, or the first determination by the court. But what one can't say is that this is some form of improper conduct that brings it into the terms of compelling... No, but couldn't, we take, but couldn't we take the view that if you're coming here to seek to appeal that judgment, whilst at the same time you are running challenges to the judgment in India, which are, are different and on the face of it look... Um, Put it, put it mildly um, weak, but that we might we might take the view that that does um, that does lead to the conclusion that if you want to argue your appeal, you ought to, you ought to put up. Uh, well, also, um, to my submission, it wouldn't, is because um, the, the first point is the reason we haven't paid judgment. There aren't any other circumstances that, that would justify that, that you see in the other cases. So it's not as if we're sitting on a pile of money or we're taking steps to um, hide our assets or we're a DVI. No, but, but you are, the way it's put against you, just to be clear, is you are being abusively obstructive in India. This judgment in England, subject to the appeal, is raised due to come. Your clients, Indian lawyers, are saying to this judgment is not worth anything. It's not, it's not enforceable. It's not on the merits. And look at the Indian contract side. That is characterized by Mr. Lillian as abusive because you're trying to place obstructions in the way of the enforcement of the judgment, even if your appeal here fails, which we, from an English court perspective, can see to be beyond the reach of reasonable argument and simply uh, an abuse of the process. Now, if he's, if he's right about that, then those are circumstances in relation to the enforceability which have arisen during the current civil appeal and would open the door to us making the order. Yeah. You then have the point you can't afford it, which is a different point. Well, Lords, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think the, the first point is we don't accept he's right about the characterisation of this document. No. Um, the, the second point is that uh, even if um, your lordships thought um, it was a hopeless point and it's one that is designed to um, delay uh, enforcement, um, it is being dealt with within India promptly. So we have a hearing on the um, 8th of um, September. Well, I, I think if you're being promptly abusive, it's no better than being no, dilatory, no, no, but it's, abusive it, in a dilatory way. It's effectively, it's, it's, it's put in a, 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 an argument which um, the court gave us permission to respond to. Um, it's one of um, other arguments which don't fall in, in, that, in that same uh, category. Uh, and it's, it's an argument that is, 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 is based as to whether, because there's an absence of an assessment of, of damages, that engages um, the protection of the Indian contract. That's how it's put. It may be a good one or a bad one. It may be that there's a cast iron defense to dismiss it, to say it's res judicata. Um, but, but your lordships would be, should be slow to reach the conclusion that it is um, an argument that is uh, uh, abusive of, 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 a, of a nature that justifies you imposing a con condition. Well, it seems to me that there, there is a difference between you step back and you look at an enforcement process. You say, look, this is going to be difficult to enforce in India because of the stages you have to go to, possibly delays. But one knew that at the outset, um, and we had the evidence uh, filed as to what what the delays would be. But but once once the defendant is actually disputing the judgment itself and its its validity, um, then that does seem to me that it puts it into a different category. Um, at that point, we have a defendant who isn't merely 
resisting enforcement or making it difficult or whatever, but he's actually calling into question the judgment well, itself. It's, I mean, the, 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 what we've done is to say, because there's an appeal, it, it shouldn't be treated as a, a final determination, which is the test for enforcement. That's the first part of the argument that you asked. Yes. yes. The second part is that um, is, is, is whether the um, amount um, is, is consistent with the Indian contracts Act um, and the way it was determined as, as, a, as a liquidated damages clause. Now, that's a question that, that, that um, isn't undermining the judgment itself. The judgment can be taken in force anywhere else. Um, it, all it's saying is whether, uh, whether the Indian courts should enforce it in light of what the Indian courts act, uh, contract law act says in relation to... Um, Circumstances where, 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 where loss and damage has, has not been proven. Now, it may be that that's not. But this is an this is an argument at the end of the day whether it's a, a penalty rather than a, a, a genuine uh, liquidated damages clause enforceable. That that's the point. Of it. I mean, I think that's underlying the point. And was that a point considered by? It was, and it was dismissed, and we didn't get permission to appeal. And it's plainly a, an English law point. Uh, yes, it's the. Uh, so certainly, in, in ter in ter yes, I would accept it's an English law point. Um, so how how can it how can we how can we looking at that regard that as anything other than an abusive point to be taken? Um, because it may well be uh, that um, applying uh, the Indian Contracts Act uh, uh, provision uh, recourse can be had to uh, whether. It, there, there is a breach of Indian law when, when it comes to enforcement. But it seems to be, even short of it being abusive, if you if you choose to take that point in India, such that what was, I mean, if you I mean, we could even say if you're right about it, that might be even more reason for us to order the payment in, because you're going to take a point which is going to render this judgment, if you're right, unenforceable. In So why should you be allowed to appeal here whilst you're taking that point? In some ways, it seems to me it's even worse if it's a, if it's a good point. Uh, I mean, the, the right to enforce um, within a jurisdiction is obviously de dependent on um, With, with the local law, yeah. um, I mean, your, your lordships can't, can't form a view whether that that, that, that is going to be accepted or, or have any effect. In a sense, you're you're prejudging the Indian court both on the merits uh, and also um, uh, as to the consequences. Um, I mean, all, all, all I can say is that um, if you're against me on, 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 on the nature of, of, of what we're asking you to take, that that of itself is one argument. Going to be dealt with promptly. It's part of, um, we would submit, uh, a process that was anticipated in the sense of the time it's taken to enforce. And it's something that is, uh, you don't have to decide because it's going to come before the Indian court promptly. But in addition, the other factors that you see in the cases are, are just not present in this case. So we, we're not deliberately not happy with the judgment. We're not copying the same sort of judgment debt. Um, our clients are not in it. In a position to, to afford what is the evidence we have as to your ability to pay? Well, my Lord, can I take you to uh, firstly, um, Mr. Sand's first witness statement, uh, and that's at um, the um, documents bundle tab 11, page 212. One, three, and it's paragraphs um, sorry, it's pa uh, paragraphs 7 to 12, so it begins in fact at paragraph two, uh, page 210 uh, and so uh, this, this explains um, the, high, the, the, the figures that are then set out in its, its accounts that were before, before the court, uh, and you'll see at paragraph uh, 8 uh, that for December 2020, it had a 
negative net worth of um, some £232 million. Um, and then your, your lordships will see um, that um, the um, paragraph 10, uh, that it's um, effect effectively um, it's, um, liability for seated assets by some £474 million. Uh, and then at paragraph 13 um, through to 22, uh, there's then an explanation as to why uh, the defendants uh, don't have access to additional funds. Uh, and you'll see the position with its uh, lenders, uh, paragraph 14. Uh, and, and your Lordship will, will no doubt be familiar with the context that this is an airline that is struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic and the complete loss of revenue. Um, paragraph um, 16 is, is an attempt to um, hostility at trying to reserve Bank of India for restructuring. Uh, and then at, um, you'll see from paragraphs 15 to 20 that, uh, that any, any, any funding from the Reserve Bank of in India would be for day-to-day -day operations rather than past liability. It's a public listed company uh, and the chairman shares Mr. Singh's are pledged um, to, to, to various uh, lenders. In paragraphs 23 and 24 then set out uh, the impact of um, COVID on, on, on the company uh, and the reference to the um, industry body IATA uh, which is reported on the downturn that airlines have faced. That then is, reflects what's the accounts that are before the court, and those are the latest uh, accounts for the 30th of December 2020. And your Lordship will see that at page, next divided tab 12, uh, pages 217. Uh, and that um, 217 is a summary of the accounts, and it's the right hand. Uh, that gives for the year end um, last three columns, uh, and your lordship will see that um, this is the negative income, which was the um, 430 odd million pounds. I'm sorry, where are you looking? 217, uh, and then your lordship will see that there's a table, and it's got um, six columns of figures. Yes, and it's the last three columns. So yes. the first three deal with quarter ends and then the last three deal with year ends. Yes. And then you'll see the profit item, uh, you'll see income uh, and then the um, expenses with profit and loss for the additional items uh, which, which remains to be paid. And then the total comprehensive income is slightly, slightly higher. Uh, and that was the uh, figure that Mr. Sandman explained. This is all in rupees. Um, and that was the figure that Mr. Sand explained in his um, statement. And then, my lords, you, you'll see a paragraph, page 220, it's a, it's a management report. Uh, and again, if I could just invite your lordships to, to read uh, paragraph um, six of the notes, uh, the, the first paragraph that, that deal with um, the effect of COVID on, on, on the airline's performance. Uh, and then um, the third paragraph on that page that then deals with um, the company liquidity position and having to um, negotiate and defer amounts that are due to um, various uh, counterparties, lessors and the like. And then paragraph um, eight over the page of page 221 summarise um, the position of the company, negative net worth. Reasons why the losses um, in the year of March 1920. And your Lordship will see at the last paragraph dealing with that uh, uh, paragraph note eight uh, is that they acknowledge um, that there's an existence of uncertainty that may create doubt about the ability to continue the going concern, uh, but they have the confidence to arrive in that concern at various um, renegotiation of the payment terms. And then the auditors page 229 and 230. And I, I just take your lordship to uh, note 6. Which then commented on that 
previous note 8 that I've showed you. Uh, but they uh, express uh, make the observation about the um, continuing material uncertainty as a going concern. Uh, and then Mr. Sands, so this, this was evidence before the, the judge. And then Mr. Sands has prepared a second witness statement, which is at uh, divider 9. At um, paragraph 10, 10 to 15, uh, effectively ex explain the um, position of that statement. He made that statement on the 21st of May. Well, when, when you come to um, consider the question of whether it would stifle an appeal. say that there is evidence which you can draw conclude that, the, that if you were to order that 
condition that the appeal would be timely. I'm just trying to think about the um, order of Lord Justice Mayo in this one. The, what Mr. Dillon referred to as the episode. Yes, well, well you, see, you saw the letter we wrote to the court y yesterday, I hope. Um, what, what happened was that um, SpiceJet um, was not was not advised uh, of, of its right to appeal until after that order on the twentieth. Decision was then made late, um, or a couple of days uh, late by reference to the deadline, uh, and the, um, the, the, the the decision was taken um, from the twenty fifth, I think, or at least that's what my solicitors learned learned about. The um, and so it's not one that was disregarding or in any way trying to conceal from Lord Justice Mayo. It, it reflects a, a, a learning and a decision that, that, that makes after the, that was made after the events. Um, it, 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 I, I can only give the explanation that is made in, in the letter, but it's one that uh, as to timing and as to when they learned of the right and chose to, to exercise it. I mean, my Lord. What, what appears to have happened is that the um, a DHC obtained an order for, for, to, to serve an affidavit um, prior to any submissions being made, and, and the appeal court in India said it wasn't uh, entitled to make that order at that stage, uh, and set it aside. Um, then there's certainly no intention on, on, my, on my client's part to, to mislead uh, Lord Justice Mayo or, or not to disclose to Lord Justice Mayo. It's, it's, it's simply um, been advised. Well, on the question of security for costs, um, I mean, I adopt the points that your lordship has made to Mr. Dillon, um, in, in the sense that um, there, there, there isn't any additional cost that would be incurred in enforcing the cost order. Uh, in relation to um, the point that my Lord Justice uh, Lord Phillips raised, um, and so far as they need to amend their petition uh, notice, uh, my clients would give an undertaking to consent uh, to that. So that would be rolled up. And in any event, um, you haven't been provided with any any valid um, identification of the costs that would be incurred in enforcement in India. You don't have a schedule, you don't have hours, uh, rates, uh, so you can't really make any assessment of the evidence of, of those costs that fall within the matter. No. Fair to say, these aren't points which you, you made in your skeleton argument. I think we did. We um, we certainly um, disputed the question of costs. Yeah. Uh, I I I would accept that uh, um, we, we we hadn't um, picked up on, on on Lord Justice the points that Lord Lordship has expressed. But, but since they had were raised and not valid to the application of um, NASA, I think we would gratefully adopt. Them. Yeah. Lords, unless um, I can assist you any further, I don't think I can leave anything in behind. Those, those are my. You're telling me about the quantum of security that has to be added to my security. Oh, um, well, my lords, you have you have so little. Um, so you have a, an estimate uh, that, that's been given, um, ranging to uh, three hundred fifteen thousand. Three hundred fifteen thousand. Two hundred fifteen thousand. That 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 that's based on the whole enforcement procedure. But if one were to be making no, that's that, the no, cost no, 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 cost of cost of the appeal. Yeah. The security for costs, yes. quantum, yep. is limited by the recoverable yes. costs of the appeal hearing, which is put at 250,000. Oh, I see. Thousand. I'm so sorry. I've sort of been a bit uh, misheard. Um, um, my Lord, at 200,000, um, and you will have much greater experience of the sort of costs we see before you, is, is, a, is, is a vast overestimate of the life of costs to be incurred on this appeal. It's true that we have got costs for today of 100,000. But then you've got a 137, um, which you've had a lot of evidence uh, that has been prepared and toing and fro. For the appeal, there is no further evidence. Uh, but there is um, effectively counsel's fee and um, solicitors' attendance. That shouldn't justify a cost of 200,000. And you might have um, perhaps seen some support 
from the uh, respondent. Um, as, uh, uh, sorry, from DHC, to justify the, the, the cost schedule, the cost incurred to operate the project. Further Do you have an estimate of your cost? They, they, they would be substantially less. I'm afraid to say they're always less than what you demonstrate. So, <laughs> um, I, 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 don't, um, I don't have one to hand. I can get some instructions, but I think I, I would be very surprised if they were in excess of um, the cost of the project. Yes. Thank you. And I would be very surprised if the court was prepared on that issue to award a cost that yes. was anywhere near 200,000 or anywhere near um, the document. So my Lord, those are my suggestions. Thank, Thank you very much. My Lord, on the, um, please, your Lordship, on the question of abuse. There are three points that are being taken in India, albeit in the context of enforcement. But the substantive points are the governing law on the penalty clause issue, the issue being whether the liquidated damages clause in an English law governed agreement is a uh, unlawful penalty. The governing law is not English law, it is Indian law. Indian Contract Act applies, that's point one. I mean, that's what they're saying. Uh, that, that's what they're saying, point one. Point two, which is follows from point one, is that uh, there is, has been no, it is a penalty, and there has been no assessment of damages in accordance with Indian law, hence the reference to or the words, violative, this judgment is violative of Indian Supreme Court decisions on damages. Yeah. Point two, the English jurisdiction clause, which provides that the parties agree that this exclusive jurisdiction clause, this, this matter should be decided by the English court, is not applicable. And three, on the question of whether this judgment, which has been fully argued, ventilated, and then dismissed, is that binding? Again, the contention is no, not binding. Indian court can look at all of this all over again. So there's three three points, albeit in the context of. I think, it, I think it said it's not a, not a decision on the merits. Not a decision on the merits because it's summary judgment. I'm not sure it's well. It follows if you say this is not. Uh, this is a penalty clause which is unenforceable therefore you must have an assessment of damages in accordance with Indian law therefore it couldn't have been done on, on summary judgment but I don't think it's expressly said yeah. that there's a problem with summary judgment so those are the three points put aside the question for a moment that this is enforcement let's just say imagine that SpiceJet went to the Indian court and ran points one and two we would be saying to this court, yeah. irrespective of whether the Indian court said this is a good point or, or a bad point, we would be saying there's a breach of contract. Yeah, he does You're not buying any support. And, and on top of that, I get an anti suit. Yeah. If they got a judgment to that effect and then they came to England, we would be saying to this court, no, this is um, uh, uh, a breach of the obligation, not entitled to recognition, and also an abusive process. And it's very easy to lose sight of the fact we say res judicata. Clearly, there's an issue of estoppel. But also, we've got the Henderson principle, which says it is an abusive process under English law to relitigate. And this is not some peculiar concept known to English law. It's a common law principle that you can't have a second fight at the cherry, especially when you've argued it once and have a final and binding judgment and especially when you've agreed this is the court that will determine that matter. So it is beyond peradventure abusive. What Mr Shah says everything changes because I have to go to India to enforce my judgment because there are no assets anywhere else that we've been able to identify. And he says ah oh, but the Indian statute says if it's not final and binding on the merits, then we'll see what the Indian court says. Maybe we're right, maybe we're wrong. All the points that your Lord, my Lord, um, uh, Lord Phillips made uh, uh, apply if it's right 
even more abusive that they're able to win in India, and if they lose in India, that does, still doesn't make this any less abusive. The critical point is they are taking this point. Whether India allows it or not is irrelevant. At its heart, it is an abuse of process. And it is abuse of process under English law, it is an abuse of process under general concepts of fairness and justice. And they should not be entitled to equivocate, to say to the English court, we apply for permission to appeal, dismissed, we're not going to appeal this issue, we'll uh, advance our appeal on this basis, and then in the Indian court on enforcement, take a completely different point, which has been determined. You and say that they're approbating and reprobating. Absolutely. Approbating and reprobating, and it is abusive, even if they weren't approbating and reprobating. So there is no getting away. Uh, uh, Mr. Shah's eloquent uh, submissions simply don't address that critical question. They should be running away from, from this point. And the Bell Awayco decision stands for the proposition that even if you cannot establish that our enforcement action, well, if you're lost, you're interested, I, I can take you. Um, it, it, it's at tab uh, 2, page 24, paragraph 22. This established the proposition, the Court of Appeal in that case, that even if your enforcement action may not prove fruitless, in other words, you, you're not saying well, the burden and obstacles are such that we'll never get the money, i.e. you may get the money, it is still, if there is a deliberate breach, which means it's not a stifling case, then uh, if it's cynically based on the practical difficulties, you can get your uh, order, albeit in that case under C, I'm taking your lordship's point about C and A. But Merchant International, so, it, 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 is, it is a compelling reason if you've got difficulty in enforcement, even if you're going to get the money at the end of the day, but it's delayed and uh, you have problems. But where there is no guarantee that you will get the money at the end of that uh, process, a fortiori, it's a compelling reason to um, grant such an order, especially where there is abuse. And Merchant International demonstrates, actually on the facts of that case, why the court is entitled to have its uh, jurisdiction engaged and to exercise it in a case of abuse. Now, the facts of Merchant International is quite detailed, but one of the factors, and you can see the factors that led Lord Justice Christopher Clarke to this conclusion at page 102. And at paragraph 50, he describes the factors. And the factors include the Hammond Saddard factors, in other words, difficulty, burden, delay, cost of enforcement, difficult to exercise, it has uh, resources both to mount the appeal and to pay the judgment debts, all the factors that I've relied on. But also, um, the um, uh, D, he says, this is not a run-of-the-mill case. Uh, NAFTO gas plainly has no intention of honouring the 2011 judgment unless forced to do so and will take all possible steps of which the appeal is one to avoid doing so. It's been assisted in this respect by the actions of the Ukrainian state and a flagrant abuse of MIC's right. And what happened there was after this judgment in, in, in England leave to enforce, a, uh, I believe it was an arbitral award, the other side, the um, judgment debtor, then went to Ukraine and in a procedurally unfair way, got a, um, a judgment of the Ukrainian court, which effectively uh, declared that the judgment was um, null and void. And clearly you can see that uh, Christopher Clark LJ was very unhappy, and that was a material factor that where, okay, you could say, I can do it in Ukraine, the judge let me do it in Ukraine, indeed the judge agreed that my judgment wasn't final and binding in England. But that doesn't lead the English court to say, well, if that's the way it is in Ukraine, then I'm just going to sit on my hands and uh, let you do it. Tough luck, uh, judgment debtor. The court there is actually saying, that is a reason why I should say, well, if you're going to come here to the English court, if you're going to engage the jurisdiction of this court, you're going to run an appeal on this basis and then do what you're doing in India, well, I'm going to say, you're going to have to put up 
uh, some uh, or all of the judgment day. So that, that's what I say about the abuse. It applies to my uh, uh, strikeout application as well as my security for costs. I say it also makes my security for costs just. On the question of stifling, yeah. just standing back, before Ms. Justice Burton, or before Sir Michael Burton, they ran the stifling point. They said, we're going to be stifled. We said there are two reasons why no stay. One is you, uh, you haven't established stifling. And two, as you saw in my skeleton argument, uh, th th whatever goes on in England will get resolved before yeah. we actually need to enforce. Yeah. Now, there isn't a written judgment of uh, the judge, but you can see from the transcript, and I, it's summarised in Mr Hawthorne's witness statement, and you've been taken to the pages, but Mr Justice Burton is clear. He is rejecting on both bases. He says in terms, and I'm, given the time I'm not going to take you to it, but he says in terms, no, when Mr Shah keeps saying, oh, but I don't have the money. He says in terms, when you see the transcript, he says no. He just shows that. Okay. Exhibit to Mr. Hawthorne's mm. uh, statement, and if you look at, sorry, page 82 is where um, the transcript begins. And if you look at E, so Michael Burton says, Now, stay, I've read the evidence, and I am not uh, at the moment persuaded, particularly after the extremely helpful and persuasive uh, response by the claimant, that's our evidence, uh, that there is the immediate problem that the defendants indicate. That's a reference to stifling, we can't pay, and in any event, the claimants say it'll take some time. So there's two points, and he's saying I, 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 I'm persuaded on both. And then there's the colloquy between the judge and Mr. Shah um, uh, 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 very eloquently tries to persuade the judge that, that uh, his stifling defence is good. And Michael Burton, so Michael Burton says, you know, evidence says the life has moved on from the evidence. And then he refers to um, Mr. Singh as the billionaire who. Um, uh, he says at page 84, I rather suspect, is it G, he's going to think it worthwhile putting some money in. So uh, which line, sorry? Sorry, at uh, G, G uh, yeah. sorry, F to G, he, he refers to Mr. Singh, he suspected that he would think it worthwhile putting some money in, and then at H, uh, 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 Mr. Shah said, well, that's his optimism, it's not borne out by the auditors, that's why I said it has been undertaken, it's moved on, the cargo business has done well, etc., etc. And uh, F is the critical passage where Mr. Shah says, Mr. Mr. Justice Burton says, you've lived with this liability on your accounts. Uh, D, the uh, auditors or the management say... Sorry, I've lost where you are. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, I'm sorry. At D, at D, Mr. Shah refers to a no, which, passage... Which, sorry, which page? I beg your pardon, 85. 85, right. At C, yes. Mr. Sir Michael Burton quotes from the financial accounts that you've been, you've been taken yes. to, which is the 31st of December 2020, and management, he says, is of the view that the going concern basis is appropriate. So you're first of all, you're a going concern, you know about these liabilities, there's no suggestion, oh, well, we can't pay. And then, uh, Mr. Shah then, uh, it's a toing and throwing, um, uh, and then um, Sir Michael Burt says, that E, you've lived with this liability for quite some time. Mr. Shah says, we have, but we do not have the funds. That this is, is all point. in the context of stay, isn't it? It is, but it, the stay was on the basis that yeah. we need the stay because the appeal will be stifled if you don't give the stay. And Mr. Mike, Sir Michael Burton said no. That's a simple point. But can, I and, can I understand this? In so far as we're looking at a contribution by Mr. Um, Singh, a payment by Mr. Singh to fund the payment in, do we have to be satisfied that he would do that? No, they have to. No, they, they have, have to satisfy you that he would not. That he would not. He he has not neither the ability or the willingness. Yeah. Lord, Lord Justice Nugent, you may, may recall the indemnity, yeah. uh, the indemnity distributions case. Yes. And your lordship said in that case that was a, a case of uh, insolvent in administration company. And the point was put then. Well, we're insolvent. How can we? 
provide the security. Your lordship made the point, I haven't brought the judgment here, it's a different case, but your lordship made the point, which follows from the, uh, the test and the principles, even if you're insolvent, that doesn't tell me are you going to be able to uh, pr provide the support? And the answer in that case... Okay, as well, in, to be fair, in that case, stifling had been expressly disclaimed. Right. Um, so, and I don't think I was attempting to say anything more than you finding gold there. But your lordship did conclude that because there was no evidence from yeah. the apparent supporter of the uh, claimant, the insolvent company, that in the absence of any evidence, then you can't establish what you need to establish, which is you would not... It really would require Mr Singh to say... I don't have the ability to provide the support. And your lordship made the point, well, 40% or whatever of his shares are pledged. Well, what about the other 60%? And what about his assets outside of the shares? So you'd have to show, I can't do it, or I am not willing to do it. And the evidence, actually, you were shown this, but the evidence of Mr. Sand is very careful to say, we are una I am unable to state whether Mr. Singh would support or not. And that, on its own, that evidence, oh, sorry, simply went, fails to meet the test. I thought it went further than that, sorry. So Mr Sand, yeah. in his second witness statement, at tab 9, yeah. page, I think you were shown this. It's page 120, paragraph 14. My Lord, yes. Spicejet is unable to state whether any of the shareholders, obviously that's Mr Sand, or any other third party would be willing to further invest or the aviation generally in view of the uncertainty. That doesn't meet the test. And your lordship is taking to the test in Goldtro, you have to establish they would be unable and unwilling. Or, or, or unwilling. And as uh, my lord, Lord just knew, knew you made point, the, the evidence didn't even come close. So, hang on, we're looking at a very specific payment here, aren't we? Yes. We're looking at whether they'd be prepared to pay the judgment debt in, in support of this appeal. Yes. So, well, stifling is made for both, security for costs and... Yes. And you've got my submission about well, security make, costs. So, so we're getting, time is moving on. Yes. We have, we need to make absolutely plain the point to you. Um, this is an appeal that Sir Michael Burton described as, as how, I think he said, a squeaker of a chance, whatever. He obviously doesn't think very much of the chances. Yes. Neither do you. Yes. If you have to enforce this judgment, it's going to take you five to seven years. Potentially, yes. Why would Mr. Singh put up 490 million of his own money, support a squeaker of an appeal, when it's going to take seven years to enforce it? 42.5. 40, uh, my, my answer to that is it's, it's a matter of choice for him. But, um, but can't we infer? can't we infer that he would be very unlikely to put up his own money to, to support. I mean, we formed a view of the appeal as well. We won't say what it is, <laughs> but it, it probably isn't very different to Sir Michael Burson's view. Yes. Why, yes. why, would, why would he put up that money uh, to support a, uh, an outside chance of winning the appeal when he knows he's, that the company isn't going to have to pay this money for years? If that is his view, then why should we have to incur all of these costs? And, and, and uh, uh, delay in this appeal. Now, well, it doesn't help you, though, does it? Well, if the appeal goes, then we've got one less thing to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. So, but in your lordships, and I appreciate your lordships have a discretion. Uh, Mr. Shaw was wrong to say a discretion under A on the question whether or not to make the order. It's a value judgment. That's Lord Justice Christopher Clark. You know, it's a value judgment. Uh, whatever the differences are between the discretion and value judgment, that, that's the correct term. But on the question of quantum, of course, your lordships are at large to say it doesn't have to be 42.5, it can be whatever you like. But two points to make on that. It doesn't have to be anything. Two, of course. Well, that, I mean, if we your lordships say there is no compelling reason, then, then, then... No, but even if so... Well, I suppose if there was a compelling reason... It, it would be rather odd to say there's a compelling reason and to say zero. Case. But, but by my lords, the, the, the two points I'll make on quantum are this. $450,000 of the judgment are not subject of the appeal. That's common ground. Mr. Morton, in his witness statement, in a footnote three in his second witness statement, says $450,000 is unappealed. Yeah. That's just uh, the matter of quantum. There's no reason why he doesn't pay that. That's a start. Well, you could say it's the other way around. That's no reason why he should, because that's, on any basis, isn't, he's not going to. 
going to... No, well, he, but, but, but uh, well, I start from the proposition you should comply with the orders of the court. And even, you don't comply, he's not complying with the 42.5 because he says, I've got an appeal. So I'm appealing that. Well, he's, not subject, he's not subject to the judgment. Sorry, sorry. Um, I mean, can, can I say, the difficulty I have at the moment is yes. that if one takes the view that it's very unlikely that a third party is going to put their own money in to support this appeal, then ordering that the money is paid in on that basis is to stifle the appeal. It will mean that an arguable appeal, albeit um, uh, a squeaker, a squeaker that, is <laughs> not going to proceed because we have ordered the security. If, if, if that were the case, then almost any application for security for costs on a uh, appeal that is considered weak, or an application under C or A that is considered weak, would never lead to, to such an order. And what I would submit. Well, not if it, not if the, not if a party has the money. Yes, but here we have a third party. That's the point. Well, but <laughs> and then you go back to Gold Trail, uh, and it tells you, uh, and this goes back to the York Motors case. It's not enough for the company to say I don't have the money. Now, put for the, the four hundred fifty thousand oh, dollars. It's not more just, just having the money. It's having the money and being willing to pay it. Well, but let me just draw the distinction. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars, which yeah. is the ju a judgment, which is not appealed. They have the money. I, I, my submission, they have, the company has the money to pay. They're going to spend almost a million pounds on this litigation alone, if you add up the costs right. orders. They're going to spend a million pounds on this. So the suggestion, we don't have $450,000 to pay the unappealed bit, is nonsense. So that's point one. Then when you get to the $42 million, I'm suggesting that Mr Singh will then have the, uh, will have the ability yes. and willingness to stump up. And your voice is putting me the point where it's a bit unrealistic to think that he will put up 42 million for this one. Yes. And my submission is why should I be subjected to an appeal with abusive conduct in India because without any, any, any because sanction? They've got, because they've got permission. Well, uh, you know, but if that were right, none of these cases, all of these cases have permission to appeal. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole set of tabs in the authority, they all had permission to appeal. Well, no, a merchant, there was a, it was a condition on appealing, wasn't it? Well, see, my long, difficulty with this point is this. Uh, the, per, the conditional order of security for costs on a permission to appeal application, i.e. before you've got permission, it doesn't even come under these rules. That actually only comes under case management or inherent jurisdiction. These rules are only engaged once you get permission. And so I have difficulty accepting the proposition that once you get permission, and of course then you have questions about well, what are the prospects and... Yeah, is it a good appeal? Maybe not so good. And I haven't got into the arguments about suggesting, well, this is a hopeless appeal and that's the reason why I should get my order. And your lordship's put it to me, well, actually, if that's the case, maybe that's the reason you shouldn't get your order. But my submission is that they've got an appeal. We have to deal with it. We have to proceed on the basis that there will be a hearing. Now, if your lordship is convinced that 42 million is too much to, to expect Mr. Singh, your lordships can order 10 million, 5 million. The, the amount is at large. So we assess and what I would much, invite your lordship you to do. Mr. Singh might think it was worth putting up to preserve the right of appeal. So, 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 <laughs> so my lord, uh, that is my submission. If your lordships are unpersuaded that 42 million is just, I would invite you to still order a significant sum. I think your lordships have that ability to order 450,000 without any question. And even if your lordship orders me, gives me security for my costs, yes. and gives me four hundred fifty thousand dollars, yes, I'd urge your lordship to do that. If your lordship were then to go further and say uh, five million or ten million dollars is an appropriate sum in all the circumstances, I would invite your lordship to do that. Of course, I am saying forty-two million, but I have said or such other sum that your lordship considers uh, 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 appropriate. So, it, in my submission, it wouldn't be right to simply dismiss the whole application and say, "Well, you won't get." any uh, uh, unless order uh, because the whole sum is unlikely to be yes. uh, 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 funded. And that's where the stifling, my, my, my learned friend seeks to prove too much constantly, to say, well, it's 42 million is too much, but it's got to be any sum up to 42. And what he ought to have done is say, well, look, we've got a million, or we've got five, or we, Mr. Singh could even have come and said, well, I'll pay 10, but I, I can't do any more than that. Uh, but he hasn't come to court. And so that's the problem he's faced with is he, he doesn't have evidence to say, I can't come up with 42 or 10 or 5 or 1. In which case your lordship and then say, well, 
uh, if that's the evidence, then there is stifling. Do, do, we, do we know uh, what, what percentage of ownership he has? Is he, is he the controlling shareholder? There's no evidence. It was but 40 percent, and that's all pledged to, to the bank. He owns 40 percent of the company. 40 percent shareholder. That, that, that I, I don't believe is correct. He's, Mr. Shah is quoting from a press article, but the press article says 40 percent of his shares. So it, it doesn't seem to be particularly in dispute that he is obviously a very substantial shareholder. What, what, what is in evidence is we put in a press article in 2017 that said he was worth 735 million, and the answer in evidence is uh, that may be then, but it's irrelevant now. 735 million what? Dollars. Dollars. So we don't have any. He's not. He's not deigned to give your lordships full, frank, cogent evidence. He is personally worth 700. That was a press article in 30. 2017. That, that was his estimated... And he would put up 400 and... Sorry, 42. 40, sorry, 42 million of that. Or whatever your lordships consider appropriate. Um, so we, um, we are sitting in a different constitution at 2 o'clock. So I think we are going to have to... Uh, do you have anything else you... My lord, no. Thank you. Um, we just give us one moment. Um, what, what we're going to do is that we will uh, obviously uh, discuss it over a short adjournment and we will endeavour to give you an answer at two o'clock. Um, I think the judgment will have to be reserved, but we but appreciate that it's important that this interlocutory skirmish is resolved so the parties can get on and get their, um, their listing and get on for the, with the substantive appeal. Um, so we, we'll, we'll come back here at two o'clock um, and um, uh, we will I, I can't guarantee you that we will necessarily have the answer for you then if not we will tell you what we will do I'm very grateful um, can I just correct one thing yes, Mr. Mr. Chair ownership, Mr. Singh's share ownership is around about 60% not 40% right. it's all pledged to the bank yes so but he has a, he's, a, he's the 60% shareholder and the rest is Thank you, that's helpful.